screen now yeah. already, so we can start. Yeah, let's start. All right, all right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, unlike previous Chrome seminars, today we have three talks, and all of them are about the topic controls. And so that's why we are having a mini workshop on controls. Uh, our first talk is given by uh, Constantin uh, Constantinos Satos, uh, who is currently an associate professor at the Department of Mathematics and Applications of the University of Naples, Federico II, Italy. Uh, Professor Satos is also an adjunct research associate at the Institute of Sciences and Technologies for Sustainable Energy and Mobility of the National Research Council of Italy. He's also a member of the board of the PhD program, Modeling Engineering Risk and Complexity of the School of Advanced Studies at Naples, and member of the Italian National Board of the PhD program in Artificial Intelligence. Uh, his, his research is at the tri-junction between numerical analysis, mathematical modeling, and also machine learning-based computations of complex and multi-scale dynamic systems. Since 2019, he's the chair elect of the Advisory uh, Board of Dynamic States Europe. He's also the editor in chief of the Elements of Dynamic Systems of Cambridge University Press. Welcome, Professor. And you may want to share screen and start the presentation. All right. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the uh, invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you again um, after one year. So uh, let me share the screen. Uh, thank you, George, for, for the invitation. Um, can you see the screen? Uh, no. Not yet? Wait. No. Uh, not, yeah, now we can see that, yeah. Uh, now? Is it okay? Yeah, yeah. All right, great. Let me put it in the presentation mode. So yeah, um, I'm going to, tell, uh, to, to talk about um, physics informed and physics free control of complex systems. And this is a joint work with um, uh, Dimitris Patsadzis, which is a postdoctoral researcher in, uh, in our group. Gianluca Fabian is um, a PhD student uh, at Scuola Superiore Meridionale, also at Johns Hopkins, co supervised by Yanis Tebritidis. Uh, Hector Vargas, also a PhD student of mine in uh, the School of uh, Advanced Studies in Naples. Dr. Lucia Russo from the National Research Council of Italy. Nikos Kazadzis from the Department of Chemical Engineering of the World District Polytechnic Institute, and Giannis Kivlikidis, a um, uh, long life uh, uh, collaborator and, uh, and friend. So, um, um, as you notice, um, my department at the University of, of Naples, Federico Secondo, is named after Renato Cacciopoli, and I would like to, uh, to say a few words about him because some of his research uh, on the topics that I will talk about. So. I don't know if you know him, but uh, he was one of the most uh, important figures in mathematics and very interesting personality of the 20th century. Uh, he was the grandson of uh, Mikhail Bakunin, the, um, let's say the leader of theoretical anarchism. His mother was uh, the daughter of uh, Bakunin. In 1927, he published an important work on integration of uh, uh, K-dimension varieties. So uh, an algebraic variety actually um, is a set of uh, solutions of a system of polynomial equations over real or com com complex numbers. And every, let's say, non singular alge algebraic variety uh, is a smooth manifold, uh, which is centered in this talk. So he established the principles of a theory of a measure of plane and the curved surfaces, and more generally, of two or uh, more dimensional varieties embedded in the linear space. So uh, he worked a lot on, um, on the uh, proof of existence of uh, solutions of uh, partial differential equations and ordinary differential equations, and especially of nonlinear problems. In 1931, he extended the Brouwer's fixed point theorem uh, applied to PDs and ODs, which is central to dynamical systems uh, to find equilibria, and also in the DFO formisms of, of manifolds. But except his scientific work, he was also political, um, very uh, involved. So in May, there is the story of 1938 when Hitler was visiting Naples with Mussolini and Cacciopoli. He was an anti-fascist, convinced an uh, orchestra to go out from a restaurant to play the La Marseillaise in the street and made the speech against Italian and uh, German dictators and got arrested. But uh, his aunt was 
an aristocrat and the, the daughter of Bakunin, and she was professor also at the uh, University of Federico II, and she managed to put him out from the jail, but they took him in an asylum, uh, declared as mad, and there he worked on the problem of existence of closed convex surfaces of given uh, Riemannian metric. He also organized a strike uh, against dictatorship. So there is also a, a movie here in Italy is, uh, I mean, is famous, the, uh, the death of uh, uh, Napolitan mathematician. So I'm, I'm saying all these things because some of the topics I'm, I'm going, we're going to see um, today in the talk. So what is the motiv motivation of my talk? It, it is that in, in the recent years, there's a big, I mean, explosion of uh, development of detail um physics biological inspired um simulators high fidelity simulators for modeling complex systems ranging name it from neuroscience uh, mechanics material science whatever and we're talking about monte carlo molecular dynamics and also very detailed and uh, um agent based models um, what is the problem? The problem is that all, all the machinery that we know, love, and we have used over the years at, are at the macroscopic level, right? So PDs and ODs are, are written in uh, at this level, the emergent dynamics, the study of the emergent dynamics of complex systems and their control are sold on, on, on this level. The problem is that there's a big um, uh, gap between time and space scale between uh, the level where we know the physics and we have terrific models, detailed models, but the analysis showed here, right? So um, the main problem, yeah, is to bridge the gap in sense of numerical analysis control with machine learning and see if uh, we can do better than traditional, let's say, analysis techniques or statistical mechanics techniques. So let me start with the uh, assumption and you know this is the uh, traditional way of model-based control design which would be the topic of my talk so we know that i mean if we have the models so these pds as these I mean, miroslav will talk about this later about pds it is also an expert in sds we can design control this is not an easy task especially for pds and sds but also for nonlinear ODs. but there are the tools uh, um, to, to do it. If we don't have a model, I mean, control engineers, control mathematicians or whatever, uh, and we, we just have data, we collect this data and we perform identification and also with the use of machine learning, right, to create surrogate models, but also to find what this PD says this and then design controllers. So this is, I mean, um, applying machine learning for, for, for system identification is um, is a story that goes back also from the uh, 90s. There is a work of Yanis Kevrikidis, for example, right? He, here is a paper that uh, in the 90s where he actually learned a, a PDE as a discretized system of what this, the differential operator actually there. And Yanis, correct me if I'm wrong, this is kind of uh, connected to convolutional networks, no? And one of my works when I was a PhD student, I was working on um, on machine learning and identifying normal normal forms of uh, of all these. So the, the, this is an, an old story, and uh, through the years we have the tools uh, both for control and system identification, ranging from uh, know, linear feedback, nonlinear feedback, stochastic control, minimum variance, sliding control, or adaptive control system, and also. Um, um, fuzzy or neural based hybrid control schemes. And from the other side, from the identification, we have the famous Tychens theorem. We can use the opponent exponents for Gare maps, basis function expansion, like PODs, normal force, and machine learning in order to, to find all these things. So the tools exist. Um, uh, but, but the thing is that these tools are, are good when either we have models and, of course, variables. Or at least we have variables and we perform a system modification. But nowadays things are a little bit more complicated for for for, for many systems, like for simple um, problems like flocking or crowd dynamics to more complex ones like the function of, of, of the brain, cognition, but also about financial um, trading. I mean, we just don't have also the correct set of variables, right? So this is a holy grail, let's say, 
to detect such variables and from them try to, to, to find some models. Um, so um, what are the main objectives for complex systems? First is to discover variables from uh, uh, high fidelity simulations, agent-based models, then in order to use these variables in order to create models, right? Um, to, to find closures, to find uh, parameters or uh, terms of PDEs that we already know that, for example, like Claire Segel, where we, we need to, to find the closures for the uh, chemotactic sensitivity or the Navier Stokes, right, where we have to find uh, the, the, the closure for a Newtonian fluid or for the viscoelastic um, fluid. So, uh, and, uh, and the second is, of course, this exactly how to bridge the, the, the two worlds, right? The, the micro world where the physics are known and the macro world where the major emerging dynamics evolve and we like to analyze them uh, and control them. So the outline of, of, of my talk today will be, um, first I will start with the assumption that I have models in the form of ODs, PDs, here ODs, and um, I will try to answer to the question if machine learning can beat traditional numerical analysis and control methods for the same problems. And I will um, uh, assess this uh, question via um, the well-known control community feedback linearization uh, of discrete maths. And I will show um, how we can do that uh, using physics informed machine learning. Then I will go on, uh, assuming that I don't have now ODs or a model describing the major dynamics, but I know some, uh, some, in, somehow the variables. I have a physical insight about the variables. And, and here is where a question free approach of, uh, of Yanis comes into the play. And uh, this is um, something that we have done um, when I was also in prison. Um, uh, working with Yanis, and um, I, I'm going to talk about the question free control of complex systems, just a brief introduction, because then I want to uh, um, conclude with um, the physics free. So it is equation free, variable free. So, how we can do numerical analysis and control if we don't know nothing? Right? So, we have an um, image based simulator. I mean, but we don't we don't know them. I mean, with what var what variable we have to um, to uh, to use in order to describe the emergent spatial temporal patterns. Okay, and I will present um, a, a problem or focus on a simple financial market within the simulation simulator, and I will show you how you can um, uh, one can design robust uh, wash out uh, controllers. Uh, in order to control and stabilize um, unstable equilibrium of the image and dynamics. Okay, so in summarizing, all in all, um, the thing is, the question in all in machine learning, the problem machine learning is about to learn or not to learn models, or maybe both. Okay, so th this is the main question, and now uh, let's deploy it. So, um, Let's go at the first paradigm where I have models, right? So there is a classical feedback linearization. And the idea, let's consider now discrete maps and nonlinear discrete map. The idea is to transform the nonlinear equations into a linear system by means of a feedback and or change of variables. And after this, uh, see this equation, I can design a, a linear state feedback in order to stabilize the, let's say, the embedded, the linear dynamics. So this is a two-step traditional implementation. We find a non-linear transformation low that end and into transformation that transforms a non-linear discrete map into uh, a, a linear and we wish controllable system in this form. And then we apply standard linear techniques, for example, pole placement or linear quadratic uh, uh, regulation to design um, a feedback control law that stabilizes the, the linear dynamics. The, the problem is that the applicability of full, especially of full state feedback linearization is not, is not that simple. It's a no problem. So for example, I can show you this paper of uh, the um, uh, 80s, 
where they discuss here all the, I mean, the obstacles and the difficulties and the assumptions about the necessary and sufficient conditions in order to find such transformations. For example, the usual way uh, that one goes is that at the end, one has to solve a set of linear partial differential equations uh, that they should be um, uh, integrable and um, uh, involutive in the sense of, uh, of the third uh, theorem. So all in all, there, it's not in his way. And um, then Nicolas Kazadis in uh, 2001 proposed an, um, a, a method for doing feedback linearization in one step. So what is the idea to, to seek simultaneously a nonlinear accordion transformation and a state feedback control, which can be written uh, as a function of this, a linear actually um, uh, function of this nonlinear transformation to transform our nonlinear discrete map in a linear system that has the desired closed loop behavior. Okay, so this is one step implementation. And at the end, one needs uh, to solve a system of nonlinear functional equations of this form with pinning conditions T at zero equals zero and the pinning condition for the Jacobian of the nonlinear transformation. So the assumptions of this transformation are not so restrictive as when uh, one wants to solve the full state feedback linearization problem. For example, there are uh, five many assumptions. The first assumption is that the matrix composed by the Jacobian and the, uh, um, uh, and the control matrix should be, has uh, to have a rank N. The second assumption is the eigenspectrum of the matrix A, that is the closed loop, response compromises from a set of eigenvalues that all inside the unit disk of the complex plane. The assumption three is that the eigenspectra of A and the eigenspectra of the Jacobian of the original system are the joint. The fourth assumption are the eigenvalues of A are not related to the eigenvalues of the Jacobian matrix with discrete map. Uh, around the equilibrium um, through any equations of this kind. And the, the last assumption pair of the matrices C and A are so uh, so chosen that the, the, this matrix has a rank N. Okay, so what is the traditional way of, of doing this? Is expanding uh, the nonlinear transformation law in a power uh, series expansion, expand the F, the right hand side of the discrete map that we assume that we know it's explicitly available also in a, in a Taylor series, in a power series expansion. And, I, and after that, put everything here and equate the terms that they are of equal order. So at the end, you solve the system of algebraic equations uh, by equating the order of, of, of terms from the left and right hand side. Uh, based on this, now we propose the physics informed um, uh, counterpart of this traditional technique. So here for our illustrations, we have used a two hidden fit forward neural network. And uh, actually the objective function, this is a physics informed neural network um, that seeks to minimize exactly an objective function having three terms. Uh, the first term is about the uh, pinning condition that the uh, sold uh, nonlinear transformation is zero at the equilibrium. Then the pinning condition that has to satisfy the Jacobian of the nonlinear transformation in this expression here at the, at the bottom of the slide comes from the linearization of the nonlinear transform system and can be derived analytically. And then, of course, the third um, uh, term of, uh, of, of the, um, of the nonlinear objective function is about the nonlinear uh, functional equations. So um, I, for this problem, we have derived analytically 
all the necessary derivatives that are uh, needed, required from an optimization algorithm like Levenberg-Margard or BFGS, or even um, simple Gauss-Newton, if we were talking about one hidden layer or random projection networks, I will not go into this, but we can do it. And of course, there are also the automatic differentiation that uh, we can use, of course, um, when uh, we use the keras of tension flow, right? So um, we have everything, so we can put everything together to find uh, the nonlinear transformation that linearizes the uh, nonlinear discrete map. So, we have taken a benchmark problem. This is a 2D discrete map. It's a simple one. And um, we can, the Jacobian is here, and we want to design the closed loop response. Here we have chosen this matrix that have the eigenvalues K1 0.84 and K2 0.0551. And with this choice, we go back to the assumptions and the eigenvalues of A, they are not related to the eigenvalues of the, of the Jacobian matrix at the equilibrium. So we end up on, on this thing. Now T1 and T2 are expressed as, um, um, as a two hidden layer, uh, as the output of a, a two uh, hidden layer fit for one neural network. We optimize the, um, the, uh, the objective function. And for this problem, we have chosen this because it can be shown in half a page that the, 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 the the nonlinear transformation can be derived analytically, and it, and it is this one. So see that um, uh, the, the first component of the nonlinear transformation, so this is two-dimensional, um, can be become can become singular in certain regime, right? So if x1 plus x2, yeah, they are minus one, then this is um, um, it's singular. We have a singular point, and here you can see the the the, the t1 surface, the two t surfaces, the is one is linear, and how the steep gradient near the critical point. So here there is a grid from zero until minus 0 0.495 for both x1 and x2. Okay, so it, it's not that a big deal. I mean, it, it is a steep gradient, but I mean, they are steeper than this. It is goes just to the minus 4.5. Uh, but uh, guess what? I mean, if you give it to TensorFlow or even to MATLAB code that we have developed using um, the, the analytical derivatives, um, it kind of will fail if you try to train it in the entire domain, okay? So um, this is the errors of the T1 uh, uh, and T2 when I use the traditional um, technique with uh, six other polynomial expansion. And this is the, the error, uh, the errors uh, for T1 and T2 when I use uh, the test of flow with um, two hidden layer and BFGS as optimizer and automatic differentiation. See here that the, the error, also all the error is concentrated and um, at, at, the, at, at, at the very, um, at this point where, at this point resembles a singularity and this relative big one is of the order of one. I mean, when this goes to minus four, it's, it's, it's a big error. So if you use more hidden layers, even more points, you will not get things better. Um, so what we did is to create a homotopy of trainings. So we use the simplest thing as zero order continuation. So we first train until things are kind of linear. Then we kind of augmented the, the grid. We expanded the grid a little bit. And then a little bit, we trained again, converged. We used the weights that we learned as initial guesses for the next round, and et cetera, until we reach the point that we want. And I mean, these are the, the summary of the results. So this is uh, when we have equations, where we have models, so we can fully implement the physics informed machine learning ap approach to find the nonlinear transformation. Uh, and here are the error norms for T1 and T2. And this is the training set, the errors on the training set. And down on table two are the errors of the test set. 
So if we go, for example, on the training of, on the entire domain, you see that the all the errors are relatively big, okay, except from this one, that of course this is the easy thing that is linear. And of course, as a linear, um, let's say manifold surface, the power series can find it perfectly if the equations are known. And then the greedy approach, the um, homotopy approach manages to actually uh, approximate the, 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 the surfaces, the nonlinear transformation quite good. Okay, and the same holds also for the test sets. We have the same um, uh, uh, order of accuracy. So, I mean, um, uh, training something, even if it's a single one, I mean, can give you some problems. You will not be able to get the right solution. You will never know if, uh, why? If you don't have an analytical expression, you will expect that kind of, uh, you will um, accept something that is not okay. And this is the summary of, of, of the homotopy thing. So what you see here on the top is the training uh, when we progressively augment the size of the grid to towards the singularity point. And you see clear that the, the, this training fails while the greedy approach manages I mean, to, 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 um, to, uh, to get good, good accuracy. Okay? So this is a recently published paper in, uh, in outside. And the um, uh, uh, take home message is that um, when training pins, uh, uh, homotopy methods and continuation methods for the training do matter, okay? So uh, we have to consider them. And here we have used just zero for the continuation, but in, a, in, in another paper where we used pins in order to solve stiff problem for hot DEs, we have used concepts, we have borrowed concepts from numerical bifurcation theory and continuation approaches and provided formulas to explicitly give good initial conditions for Newton iterations in order to speed up um, um, computations. And we have managed to, uh, to speed up computations a lot using continuations and, uh, and to uh, uh, get better numerical accuracy results. So actually, yeah, when I have equations, so the speed is I have all this terrific machinery and I mean, machine learning can beat the traditional approach. This is what we showed because it can do better than the, for example, polynomial or um, expansion that we use using also continuation methods, et cetera, that can be straightforwardly um, integrated in the uh, physics informed machine learning uh, framework. And, but do we need uh, explicit equations or if we had a black box, time stepper that we know the variables and we just measure the input and output. I mean, can we take, get the same results? The question is yes, because I mean, there is this, this is all about numerical analysis. It's about large scale systems analysis, right? And even if we have, I mean, um, large scale systems, we can use the arsenal of, of, of Krilov subspace integrations, the matrix free linear algebra to, I mean, to, to act um, in, in, in the critical subspaces and reduce commutations. For example, the, the famous Arnoldi thing, if we have a black box code, right? So um, we don't know this explicitly, or it is very, I mean, um, overwhelmingly complicated in order to find uh, derivatives or we're lazy to do that. Then we can, I mean, Put, uh, get an input, take the output, which is yk plus one after uh, I mean, um, um, a short time interval. Then we perturb this vector with uh, e times q. And we know that this is the directional derivative, right? And with on um, um, a q, a is the Jacobian of the system. So um, if we do this iteratively, we can create an orthogonal basis in the Krilov subspace. And it can be proven in two pages that the projection of A of the Jacobian in this subspace results on an upper Heisenberg matrix with whose eigenvalues are very good approximations of the critical eigenvalues of the original Jacobian matrix. So, the machinery is there, 
and we have used it to do the same thing only assuming now that I have just the variables of the discrete map and I don't have the equations per se. And guess what? I mean, the numerical approximation accuracy that we get is a black box um, uh, approximation taking um, uh, finite differences to calculate um, the Jacobian because here is a two by two. They are almost the same as the ones that uh, uh, we got with the pins, uh, assuming that the equations and the analytical derivatives are given. So, um, Having finished this part, now I will go to the second, where now I will assume that I don't have equation but just variables. I show you something on this about if we have, I mean, all these, and then I can take the input output map. But the additive value here is when I don't have actually a well determined differential operator but I have uh, agent-based model that can be also stochastic. Uh, so I don't have the equations for the emergent dynamics. I have a messy high dimensional with even millions of uh, degrees of freedom simulator. So uh, my assumption is uh, that we have an agent-based dynamical model that uh, given a, a, a distribution of states that we call U capital at time TK, it will integrate with the rules of the agent-based model. And after some time, after some time interval, it will output, right, the, um, again, the, this detailed distribution of states. Uh, CTU is the time evolution agent-based simulator. So uh, the basic assumption here is that the emergent coarse grain dynamics, if they exist, if we are in principle able to write down PDs or these, then the emergent dynamics uh, should be governed by a few variables. I will denote this by X. And usually these variables are the first few moments of the underlying macroscopic distribution as for example, in flows, it, it is the density uh, and the velocity field, the first moment, the average uh, velocity field and the average density. So um, the, what in, this implies, implies the existence of a slow coarse grain manifold that can be para parameterized by this X. And this is what Yanis Kevrikidis uh, uh, has proposed with the celebrated equation free method in order to bridge these two worlds in a numerical uh, strict way. So this is um, actually the whole assumption that the existence of a coarse grain slow manifold where the emergent microscopic dynamics exists. And the whole thing is how one now can construct this coarse grain to, to, to find models from this coarse grain manifold find models as discrete input output maps. And this is what the equation free approach of Young's does. So assume that you have a PD, then you can discretize it in space and time using FEMS or use, um, you know, um, steep solvers and get I mean, numerical accuracies as, uh, uh, as high as you want. Um, and you can apply all this machinery of bifurcation theory, also of control theory to design controllers. As I'm saying things simplistically because design control speed is not so uh, easy. Miroslav will say something more on this on his talk. So uh, the, the thing is what if we, we have a messy, big, high dimensional in the base simulator, then that takes millions of states, runs this with some rules and now puts after some time, again, millions of, of, of freedoms. So what we can do is lift, if we know the variables, we know that in principle, we can, I mean, uh, write a model for the density for the flow, uh, only that we don't know that this is a Newtonian fluid, right? So we know that is the, uh, the, the density. So we can create, for example, a Gaussian distribution Right of particles, so we run that have the, the 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 desired density. We run this distribution, we get another distribution, and we restrict back. 
So what we are doing with this thing is that we kind of um, um, we, we we kind of fool the superstructure here that does not understand now that we don't get PDEs, but understands that input course input output pop, and we can do the same things as we would do if we had analytically equations. All right. So the main assumption of the equation free approach is macros macroscopic model exists, but we're not so smart to derive them. But in principle, can be written uh, uh, using a few low order moments of the evolving distribution. So think. Uh, I have a question here. Yes, uh, tell me, George. In, in 2023, we, we could revisit this and think about neural operators that do the same job. And in fact, using symbolic regression to derive equations from the neural operators. Has anybody thought uh, that from, for this problem from the micro to macro? Uh, let it, this is a, a good question, uh, George, and I will come to this at the end of my talk. I want to discuss this. <laughs> this is this is okay. Yeah. All right, thank you, thank you. So yeah, so you can think, uh, as I said, for example, uh, as the maxwell Maltzman distribution of, of, of speeds, if you want to write down an OD for the temperature, you don't want to take a avocado number of particles. We know that, I mean, it is the mean kinetic energy. So if we want to lift, to run a molecular dynamics code, we can construct a Boltzmann distribution, no problem. We can run the molecular dynamics, lift back, take the temperature, and here you go. We can take and let's say um, um, a discrete input output map. Okay, so this is all about singular perturbation systems, but let me go because time passed. So um, the thing here is that we'll take a, a Gillespie Monte Carlo implementation of the uh, NO reduction by hydrogen uh, on a catalytic surface. Here um, we know that the physical variable is the coverage of absorbed NO. So it goes like that uh, in the Monte Carlo simulations, NO is absorbed in the catalytic surface then it, you know, there is a dissociation, the same for the hydrogen. And then the, the two atoms form uh, a, a hydrogen, uh, water and NO2, and they, they dissolve, okay? So um, we can write a master equation. And from this, we can derive a mean field model. We're liking this in this, uh, because it's a, it's a simple one. So there's a deterministic mean field, mean field model for this. And we have, Jan is one of the first applications that did with uh, Alexei Makiev was to um, um, see that uh, replicate the bifurcation diagram of the mean field model with the molecular dynamics via the uh, equation free approach and there is exact maths, okay? Because it's homogeneous and all this stuff. So with the solid lines, you see the bifurcation diagram of the deterministic model. And with the uh, um, sequels, you see what you get from the equation pre approach. So, perfect match. So, what we did uh, with uh, Yanis and Nikos uh, was applying equation free control on the Mon Mon Monte Carlo simulator. Okay. And we wanted to stabilize an unstable point using the full Monte Carlo simulator, not the equations. And what we did is uh, going the traditional way. We created the course time stepper. And then based on this, we expand as in the traditional way, the nonlinear transformation in, in Taylor uh, series. And then we solve an optimization problem. So our, let's say course grain map was the uh, artificial network, the physical, let's say, artificial neural network. It was the agent day simulator. So, I mean, we got a perfect match and um, um, we got the same things as if uh, with the results that we got with the analytical mean field model. And, and these are the responses. So we were able to stabilize the stochastic simulations, the stochastic um, 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 uh, Monte Carlo simulator. So let me continue with a more complex system that is the um, um, agent based simulators that here again, we don't have macroscopic equations for the merge dynamics, but I know I have some physical insight about the, the variables. So the model goes like that. Um, think of a society of, of, of financial market where uh, each agent can, is described by his mood to buy or sell a stock. Uh, so um, new scam 
right? From the media, from the economical indices, from the government, for whatever. And I mean, when bad news come, I mean, he 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 kind of gets. Um, uh, so if new if no news, he he drifts to the center. There is no will to buy or sell. So if bad news arrives, then he jumps on the left in a quad um, uh, way sense of epsilon minus. If good news come, he jumps in a quadum way on the right, stochastically. And this good news and bad news come with uh, a Poisson distribution in time. And uh, if there are many more positive than negative, it will uh, reach the one where he sells everything and then he comes again and again. And, and, and the opposite, if things go wrong, he wants to sell things, not to buy, and comes again to the zero. So uh, the, the, the thing is that he also inflates but his neighbors, right? So um, this is a positive feedback. So the dynamics of this age, and it's described by stochastic OD, we can get 50,000 such stochastic ODs, and here it is the discrete version. And the eyes are the discrete jumps in the state that comes with the Poisson uh, distribution in time uh, with arrival frequencies V plus and V minus respectively. Okay, and as we said, these arrival frequencies of bad and good news come from, let's say, the state propaganda, but also from the media. This is the exogenous, but also from its friends. This is the, the, the G gain factor, how many links you have in the network, and the buying and selling rates. I mean, you see what the others do, and you want to do the same thing. Okay, so um, Omurtak and Sirovitz have derive the Fokker Planck in terms of the density for this agent-based model. This is an integral partial differential equation. It's a messy one. Um, and I mean, we have compared equation free in the paper with Yanis and Bill Gear back in 2012, the bifurcation diagram of this Fokker Planck with equation free. So equation free is precise. The Fokker Planck, this approximation is not precise. Uh, we have used fork implying based on the PDA, on the density function, using already knowledge, a physical side about what are the correct variables. Okay, so um, I will skip this. So the thing is that there is a critical point that we can um, see that the, the, the equation free bifurcation diagram is the correct one. Let me let, let me um, show this. So I sorry, I will go out. So if I run this for a G equals 42, so you see all the agents in this, the, the mean uh, mood of the agent. So this is go to a stable point, no problem. So this is G42. Uh, remember that at 42 already, uh, it is uh, beyond any solution of the 40 plan. Um, so the equation free approach gives the correct uh, equilibrium. And if I go a little bit uh, uh, farther from the, uh, from the equilibrium, things blow up. Okay, things, we have a bubble in, 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 uh, in the stock market, okay? So um, what now, uh, so Gianluca Fabiani did, the, the first one on the um, on the physics informed uh, feedback realization is was a um, work of Hector Vargas and uh, Gianluca Fabiani. And, uh, here, uh, Gianluca trained a, a neural uh, network, knowing the um, the physical variables, the core physical variables that these are density, the spatial view of this, and also the buying and selling rates with the integral on the right and left uh, sides of the distribution. So we compare this with what equation three gives, right? So the surrogate uh, uh, neural network. So it, it is not so precise. See, here you see with the lines, the equation three, which is, let's say, the real bifurcation diagram. And with the dotted uh, things with the uh, neural network. So the blue ones is the random projection neural networks that do better than a two hidden layer for, for a fit for a neural. So, I mean, the approximation is okay, but it's kind of dirty. It's not accurate uh, if, if you compare it with equation three. So 
what we want to do is now control the unstable state. So control this point here, which is saddle point. So if we go at this point, and I, you see how the system behaves, depending on the stochasticity, things can go down, right? Or things can, can blow up, right? So I want to control an unstable market in order to maximize profit, let's say, right? So um, this is now where Dimitris Patsadzis um, uh, has done this, uh, this, this work. So this is a, 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 a variable free equation. Free. So I don't know nothing, right, about if this is a PDE, if uh, I can take the probability density function, this is the only variable that I can do, right? And when I deal with such problems, then I deal with the case of dimensionality also in machine learning. And this is a nice cartoon that I like. This is from 1968, and this is the case of dimensionality life, which is much more difficult than it. Uh, case of dimensionality in machine learning. There are many suboptimal conditions that one has to take every day, but also during his life, and can be tough ones and maybe also wrong ones. And this is the case of dimensionality in machine learning, um, where things are easier than life, but still make our life uh, difficult, uh, at least the scientific life. And this comes from the input dimension, the number of neurons, hyperparameters, and non-convexity. And the key here is exactly to, to find a, a set of variables in order to parameterize the, the slow manifold where the metal dynamics evolve. And that, that is breeds actually using now a couple of these with equation-free um, uh, approach. And the key here is coupling manifold learning and equation-free approach. And this is what Dimitris Patsadis did. So from the agent-based simulators, he applied diffusion maps to go in a latent space where we found the variables. And then we can create a whole equation-free framework on this high dim uh, low dimensional manifold. The problem is that we want to control things in the Abelian space. No problem, because then we can solve from this space the pretty much problem and go back to the Abelian space. And then run things, restrict, go again to the, um, to the low dimensional space. And then based on this course time stepper, we can build the bifurcation diagram on the manifold, but we can reconstruct this bifurcation diagram by solving the free mass problem again on the high dimensional space. And then we design embedded controllers in this, and then we can lift again these controllers on the high dimensional space. So this is the, the, the overview of this. So Dimitris has applied this and um, uh, of surprise, uh, we found that the first diffusion map components is one-to-one -one with the mean value of the distribution. So we use just one variable, that is the mean value of distribution, and we solve the pretty much problem using geometric harmonics. I don't have the time to go more in this. And we constructed the same accurate uh, bifurcation diagram um, with just one variable, with diffusion maps and going back, the one that we have used uh, using the full probability density function, so a PD, let's say discretized PD using the equation free approach. And this was a very nice result. And then uh, we have proposed a washout filter. What is a washout filter? A washout filter is a, a, a controller, a dynamic controller like a PI, like that. Um, actually, goes out model asserted and numerical inaccuracies. We have proven also its robustness against the solution uh, for the pretty much problem and the Nikström extension problem. I don't have uh, I think time to go into this. And here are the simulation results. So, applying this uh, embed, run and control, lift uh, approach, we have stabilize the unstable. So our control variable are the negative uh, news that can be kind of controlled by mass media or propaganda or whatever. And we have stabilized this and this, the, if you take the average value, you take a long time, is the actual uh, equilibrium of the agent base, the, the, apparent, the apparent equilibrium of the agent base simulator. So, um, so going into the final slides of my talk. So the question is, and going also to uh, George's George um, um, comment, 
the question is to learn or not to learn. So use fully physics informed machine learning on deep learning or equation free. So, I mean, this is just my sketch. You can, we can discuss and you can say um, by yourselves. So I have written here that we use, I mean, um, when we have these equations, uh, when we're going to have some physical inside for the differential operators and the closures, when we want to uh, learn something and then use it many times in a quick and dirty, dirty way, um, when we have some physical inside uh, about the PD and we want to find terms or closures for this from high fidelity simulators, from the other side, the equation free approach is the way to go when we have, we want to do numerical analysis in an accurate way, when we have aging based simulators and high fidelity models and we know uh, how to do the lifting, which is not trivial. And then doing both exactly is to create emergent space times, I mean, use DepotNet, and then couple this with nonlinear manifold learning and the equation free approach. I mean, this is a wonderful discussion in the uh, Nature Review paper for George Gannis and uh, at all. And yeah, so I mean, kind of this is next generation, let's say, equation free in order to create imagine latent spaces where we can learn the differential operators. Okay, and with this, some references of the work that I have uh, present you. So I think I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, in time and thank you for listening. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so I think we have, a, we have a question from the chat. Uh, from Guang Chen Jason Yun. So, Guang Chen, are you are you there? So we're now we we can do Q and A. Yes. Oh yeah, uh, I, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm on the way to back to my job. But if you wanna uh, say, I can I can stop my car and uh, share my idea on the. Uh, physical informed machine learning to get an analytical solution, you know, or uh, to build a uh, um, uh, uh, mathematical model for, uh, you know, because uh, people try to uh, use chat GPT to generate uh, to research papers or, you know, any kind of language document. But I believe it's possible to generate a you know, mathematical problem like a uh, uh, non stochastic problem. The stochastic problem has no exact solution, right? So. If there is an analytical solution existed, like a, you know, a very simple question, like a long living dynamics or kind of, uh, so, yeah, so uh, it, it, I, I, my question is, is it possible to use PIML uh, to get an analytical solution or uh, build a mathematical model? Uh, you know, and then people can solve it using, you know, a uh, numerical approach or something. So that's my question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's it. Okay, I mean, uh, I mean, I'm not the only one that can uh, can, uh, can put an answer to this question. It's more of a uh, philosophical one, right? Um, I mean, uh, you know, this is for Neumann there saying that um, it can appear to have reached the limits, but the future is ahead of us. Um, I'm not so, I mean, optimistic that we can solve everything in the, in the next five years, but we can asymptotally go to the absolute truth. Okay, but this will take years and years, but I'm, I'm not sure if we can ever kind of, I mean, Think of this also models are phenomenological ones, right? Also, when your stock is not, I mean, it's about the mathematical operator that we have invented by yourselves, I mean, to, to model things. I mean, um, so we need uh, um, more developments in mathematics, numerical analysis to advance things also in machine learning. So this goes hand by hand. So, you know, this is my uh, uh, two cents in this. If I, well, first of all, you have to say uh, that uh, you cannot use ChatGPT in Italy because it's- uh, Ah, it's, it's ChatGPT, yeah. ChatGPT, I, I would not use in any case because I, I have used it and it was all wrong, right? So it was excusing no, but, itself. But, 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 but no, it, yes, you are, you are right, I'm wrong. I mean, yeah, also for, <laughs> 
So no, I would not use it, even if I was but not in, the, in Italy. Note, I, I think on the serious note, I think there is uh, an opportunity here uh, to use neural operators of any flavor uh, together with, uh, certainly for your, for, for your topic B, where you know the variables, and then uh, you could write down equations uh, using symbolic regression. Now, the question is, and, and I was looking at at your uh, results with uh, Spirovich's uh, model, uh, it looked to me that was limited from, the, and you said it's, a, it's an integral operator, that looked to me that uh, that it had the limitations of the old uh, dated integer calculus. If you were using there a fractional Fokker Planck equation, you could have actually expressed it much better in a much more, much more compact form. So, could so if be. we open our minds, I think would be uh, uh, one. I, I like your idea of, of combining uh, equation free with um, neural operators in general. I think that uh, some younger people will, will pick it up and, and run with it. But I think there is a lot of opportunity there. I don't know a what Yanis. A lot of opportunity, and also Yanis yeah, can say something. I mean, I, yeah, I can yeah. say, yeah, I can say something. Thank you, Costa. Uh, uh, what I wanted to say is the following. When you in, uh, think of what you do when you're integrating, you have, let's say, a differential equation, and you want to do a, a, a solution of the differential equation. What you do is that you do a local linear model when you do forward Euler, work with that, and then throw it away. At the next step, you make another local linear model and another local linear model. Equation free is like that. You don't learn a good surrogate. You create little surrogates on demand where you want to do a calculation and throw them away. While when we learn operators, you really learn the operators globally. So I, I also very much think that there is some kind of common ground between the two. In both cases, you learn something. In equation free, you learn just enough to do the next calculation step. While in learning operators, you learn something which is usable to do all kinds of things. The, the, this is also, I think, why we did not learn big surrogate models. The big thing in equation free is do just enough calculation to find what you want, not create a surrogate. I think no, if you, I will, I will shut up. I think if you need to use a surrogate many, many times, then it's good to learn a good surrogate operator. If you want to do just enough calculation to get a steady state and optimum or whatever, maybe you don't need to learn a globally good surrogate. Sorry for talking too, too long. And, and also, <laughs> if, I, if, I, if, if, if you allow me, George, what you said about fractional differential operator, it is a good point. This is not here in this problem. It, it seems, I mean, kind of, it's not trivial because one has to deal, we know that, Yanis and uh, uh, Gianluca, um, his work, finding the boundary condition is not trivial in this problem. I mean, it's a messy thing. I mean, this is a messy PD. I mean, also it's not well-defined. So there are many open things here. Uh, so on Yanis' point about the local, it could be used that as a, um, you know, multi-fidelity training of, uh, of, an, of the operator or for global mapping because you, you, you would like the local mapping, right? But you don't throw away that information. You can actually store it to, to, to yes. train the operator. While at the same time, you may also have some other information, experimental data that goes from, you know, you don't have the micro scale, but you have the macro scale. So that will give you the macro, the mapping. So so you, you, you blend the data from the, from the micro scale with a, uh, with a macro scale to to, uh, to to develop this multi-scale operator, which is um, uh, and and I've, we've done that for uh, for a physical problem. You know, we uh, went uh, the, uh, continuously and uh, seamlessly a, um, blend uh, atomistic data with continuum data, with the Rayleigh Plessé yes. equation for tiny bubbles and big bubbles and so on. So so it is possible and it is a it's a good form. I I was wondering if anybody has tried because every day I I wake up and I see people have tried a thousand things. There's even now a GPT pin, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a good point. That yeah. was a few days ago. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, any other questions? No comments? No? Okay. Right. 
We're right on yeah, time. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Zoker, maybe you can uh, introduce Miroslav and we could have yeah. a long day. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let Thanks. me stop sharing. Thanks. Sure. Uh, okay. So now we move to our second talk. Our second speaker is Professor Miroslav Kerstik, who is a distinguished professor and senior associate vice chancellor for research at University of California, San Diego. He's fellow of nine scientific societies, including SAM, IEEE, ASME, IFAC, AAAS, and Serbian Academic Sciences. His lifetime achievement awards include IEEE Bold Lecture Prize, the Bellman Control Heritage Award, Siam Reed Frick Prize, and ASME's Oldenburg Medal. Uh, in addition to about 450 journal papers, Professor Kerstik has authored 18 books on adaptive nonlinear and stochastic control, extreme seeking, and control of PDEs and delay systems. He's one of the two highest cited researchers publishing principally in control systems. Uh, welcome, Professor. Thank you for attending and giving the talk in our consumer. And you may want to start. Thank you so much, Zogren, for the introduction. I hope that I can be heard clearly. Yes. Excellent. And I also want to, to start by thanking George for inviting me and also for uh, to, to thank uh, Yanis Gebrekidis for connecting me and introducing me uh, to George. It's really a pleasure to be here. What an amazing forum. And, uh, and it's nice to share the opportunity to speak with uh, Konstantinos and with Jerome. Uh, I also want to acknowledge two people who are, who are here, my longtime uh, collaborators uh, in PD control. Uh, one is Yasun Karafilis, who is a, a mathematics professor at NTU uh, Athens, uh, but started his career uh, in Crete, in Georgia's uh, home island. Uh, and uh, another one is uh, Rafael Vasquez, um, a professor of aerospace engineering at the University of Sevilla, Spain. Uh, I have to, before I start speaking, I have to apologize that I cannot stay uh, physically for the first talk. I'm going to have to, uh, to listen in uh, while driving to a meeting on campus. Uh, but I've already looked up uh, Jerome's uh, paper uh, on archive, and I'm looking forward to uh, to hearing more details. Uh, let me say that that this is the uh, the first presentation of my my talk. I've never given it. Uh, it's totally untested, unrehearsed, totally unknown how much uh, of it is absorbable, how much of it I can cover in that's in the slides, and by how by whom it, what I have to say is absorbable. Uh, so it's likely to be far from fully clear and, and smooth. Uh, so uh, let me just mention that, that learning is not a foreign uh, subject to me. My whole career has been at least partly in adaptive control of nonlinear systems from my, uh, my PhD. Uh, but none of it has been connected with neural networks. Um, it's been it's involved uh, learning of linearly parameterized functions. My interests over the last uh, twenty pl uh, plus years have been in control of PDs. So let me start by by mentioning something that's very important to frame this uh, uh, the, the questions uh, being pursued here. To control an OD system, namely a system with a vector state, you need to solve finite dimensional equations, nam namely matrix equations. And that's not what we are here for, um, those of us interested in, in um, nonlinear operators. Uh, likewise, by full analogy, to control a PD, you need to solve a PD. But it's not th that PD that you control that you need to uh, solve. It's another PD that is uh, independent of time. It's a spatially uh, dependent PD, as you will, you will see. The uh, neural operators were introduced to me by uh, my collaborators, whom I will, will um, mention uh, in a second. And it's clear that they're potentially game-changing for, uh, especially for PD control and, and probably for control uh, more broadly. Uh, so the, the reason why I'm here is, uh, the exchange over the last uh, year or so, uh, and the work over the last two months or so with uh, um, uh, Yuan Yuan Shi, who's an assistant professor in electrical computer engineering at UCSD, and Lupan, 
who is a PhD student with background in computer science and uh, physics also at UCSD. So let me uh, tell you what I'm going to, uh, to cover. Uh, by the way, the item number one that I crossed out, I just put it back in, so it's in. Uh, so after a very brief uh, motivation, uh, I'll tell you about PD control assisted by neural operators in uh, uh, the hyperbolic context where functions of only one variable might arise. And this is, this is a warm-up uh, problem. And then parabolic PDs where functions of at least two variables arise. Unlikely that I will have time, uh, but I may tell you a little bit about the extension from controllers to the so-called observer state estimators, and also uh, about the extension of neural operators from computing and modeling uh, the nonlinear operators uh, for gains of controllers to nonlinear operators that model the full feedback clause, namely uh, operators that model the, uh, the mappings from not, not only the system parameters, but also the system states measured the line into uh, input values. And finally, I'll very briefly uh, tell you about the punchline of all of this uh, through uh, gain scheduling for nonlinear PDs and adaptive control for PDs with unknown parameters, namely combining uh, offline lear learning with online learning. So what you'll see in this talk, uh, the first two bullets are, are what you always, uh, I believe, see in uh, talks on nonlinear operators. Uh, uh, the first is that, that uh, machine learning approximates them. Uh, the second is that uh, there are ways to, uh, to get results that accelerate computation by a factor by, by maybe three orders of magnitude or more. Um, but the third bullet is what I expect you don't regularly uh, see, uh, the reason why I'm here, uh, and that is uh, that with controllers um, implemented through neural operators, we retain the stabilizing properties of PD control laws in spite of the approximation errors. Uh, this sounds intuitive, and the interest in it is that proving it is, is far from uh, elementary. So let me, uh, I was going to take out these slides, but then when I saw the abstract for Jerome's talk, when I saw that uh, Hamilton Jacobi and the linear quadratic regulators uh, are the bread and butter uh, in this series, I thought, no, no, this, this is back in. This is the motivating talk for why uh, operators are of interest in the context of uh, control of any kinds of systems. So let's start with finite dimensional linear systems. So let's formulate an infinite horizon optimal control problem. The solution to that uh, control problem is a feedback law with a feedback gain K, which is a product of the input vector B and the solution P of the Riccati equation, where the Riccati equation is given here. And when you look at this, this equation, which happens to be quadratic, but its nonlinearity in P is not what's crucial. You see that it's actually nonlinear in uh, um, the, the, the mapping from A and B because of the, um, uh, the product relationship uh, to P is nonlinear. So even for linear systems, Nonlinear mappings from the uh, model data to the control gain arise. It's just that these mappings are not something we uh, we are addressing in in uh, this seminar series because they're finite dimensional um, relationships. They're functions of many variables. So it is in PD control that rather than functions of many variables, nonlinear operators arise, whose outputs are gains of the PD controllers. Why is this of interest? Why does this matter? First of all, uh, it is potentially very impactful in any real-time context because the computation of the control can be accelerated uh, by three orders of magnitude, quite typically. Uh, but what are those contexts? There are two of them. 
One is control of nonlinear PDEs where the gain scheduling approach can be, or, or time varying PDEs where the uh, gain scheduling approach can be uh, employed. Uh, and for whose implementation you need to resolve these uh, control gain PDEs over and over in real time. So how fast you can do that matters. The second context is even more challenging, and that's the context of unknown PDs and unstable, uh, where uh, you again have to resolve for each new estimate of the, of, of the um, PD model coefficients, you have to resolve for the gains. So again, there are PD uh, controls to, to, to solve and uh, an operator is relevant. So let's start with a pedagogical problem, the simplest one there is, and that's a single first order hyperbolic PD where uh, the functions that are being mapped and their images are functions of only one variable. That's, uh, it's very important for that to be clear before we get into functions of multiple variables. So I'm starting with the hyperbolic class, one uh, derivative in both time and space. This is a trivial PD. This is not what, what I'm starting with. I'm starting with this PD, a PD that has recirculation from the outlet, where the outlet is uh, the point x equals zero on the unit interval domain. So uh, this kind of recirculation can appear in various applications, especially when you simplify the models. But I'll give you one that we can all relate to, and that's traffic dynamics where routing apps introduce this kind of non-local effects. We all get influenced by what's happening somewhere else rather than uh, only by what our neighbor, uh, what the car in front of uh, us is doing. So this recirculation can and does cause instability. Let me show you what that instability looks like. This is the time axis. The vertical is the state axis. Uh, and uh, this is the space axis, and you see that as the time advances, oscillations develop, and you have an exponential growth of the state u of x and time. Now, where is the control in all of this? The control uh, in all of this is at the inlet end of the um, um, spatial interval. So it's at x equal 1, whereas the outlet is at x equal to 0. We call that boundary control. Uh, we do boundary control for two reasons. First of all, because it's non-intrusive. Um, it's, it's the least intrusive approach to control of uh, PDs. You don't, you don't place actuators inside the fluid that you're trying to, uh, to impact, but at the walls, et cetera. The second reason is that it's probably, it's certainly the hardest form of PD control. And here's why it's, it's hard. It is because the feedback that is, the positive destabilizing feedback that is created through the recirculation acts at all points X in the domain zero to one, whereas the control gets to uh, apply an input only at the boundary um, X equal to um, one. So you somehow have to reach through the PD dynamics at most, Specifically, you have to reach through the uh, through the um, advection or convection and the transport to suppress the instability that is not matched with your uh, boundary control input. Uh, how do, how is that done? Well, there is a tool for that, and it's called the PD backstepping design, and that this is the design that that. Uh, uh, that I introduced maybe you know, 22, 23 uh, years ago and has kept me in, in this field of uh, PD control since then. So the ideas for PD backstepping come from actually finite dimensional feedback linearization that uh, Konstantinos spoke about. It's a continuing version in a way of feedback linearization. Even when the PD is linear, the logic uh, of the state transformation into something desirable and where the undesirable terms are matched with control is captured in this continuum PD backstepping. 
So there is a state transformation and feedback. What kind of state transformation? A state transformation that scoops all of the recirculation that is inside the domain and brings it to the boundary x equal to one is this Volterra transformation. It's a spatially um, causal uh, or spatially triangular transformation that involves a spatial integral up to the current spatial position x. Uh, so this is identity minus the tri uh, triangular transfer, uh, transformation. If you want to, to discretize it, this is the identity mi matrix minus the triangular matrix. The whole thing is invertible. And what does it do? First of all, it brings all of the bad stuff, the, uh, the destabilizing recirculation to the, um, uh, to the boundary, and then the control can cancel it or dominate it. The gain of the control is the same as the kernel of this transformation, but with x set to 1. I will elaborate all, more on this, but let me just, just give up that preview. And what is the motivation and the end result? The motivation is that after the transformation and feedback, the system obtained in the new variable w uh, has the recirculation gone or deleted it by feedback, by non-collocated feedbacks. It's truly magical uh, thanks to the, the Volterra transformation. And what is obtained, this, this target system, well, the target system is just, just a delay with, with zero input. It's a trivially stable system in a finite time, in, in the duration of time equals equal to one time unit, more than exponentially stable. Okay, so that's, that's the preview of backstepping. What is the goal of backstepping? The goal of backstepping is to turn that, that growing exponential oscillation into uh, a stabilized uh, system. So uh, let me now remind you what, what this is about. This is chiefly about finding the gain, namely finding the kernel of the backstepping Volterra transformation and the same gain, uh, the, the same function that plays the role of a gain in the feedback law. So that's our protagonist, the function K. Now, uh, the question is, what should that function k be? The answer is that you need to find conditions so that the original system with recirculation is transformed by that transformation and feedback into this system. There are calculations. I think that even, even a first year engineering undergrad can, can perform them. There's a little more there than integration by parts. And one arrives at a condition on k in terms of the coefficient of the PD beta. This is the condition on K. So then this undergrad, having taken a signals course, notices also that this is a convolution uh, operation between beta and K. And now I write it even more compactly for you. So beta is the input. This is what's given. This is the PD um, model coefficient. And K is what we are seeking. So in the convolution notation, this is, um, this is uh, the problem that needs to be solved for k. Now, you look at this, and it's obviously linear in k. But in, in terms of the relationship from beta to k, it's not. You see, uh, you see that this is, this is bilinear. Now, if you still have any doubts, then uh, please take, you know, perform another undergraduate operation, and that's the Laplace transform. And the Laplace transform gives you uh, the relation from beta to k in this form. So that definitely is a nonlinear um, non uh, relationship, or rather, the mapping from beta to k, which we denote by, by this uh, calligraphy k, is a nonlinear operator. So we are here in the right place to discuss this subject. So, what kind of a relationship is it? How to, how to imagine? K for some beta. So here's an example. Just you know, you can uh, you can produce millions of examples. Here is an interesting one um, for some beta that is not periodic, but it's also very un, un, uh, uh, non-constant in uh, in space. The image K is given by this uh, 
red, and you see that this, this red is not simply a flip version of, of blue. So that's what the transformation does it, does, does to it. So let's now return to, to, the, uh, to the problems of generally solving uh, and approximating this operator from beta to K. So this brings us to the heart, the, the enabling element for everything here. And that's this uh, deep on uh, approximation theorem, um, which I don't know if it's already been published in a journal. We're, we're uh, uh, borrowing the information from the archive version. So the, the key thing here is that there is an, op uh, an operator, uh, G, from some function space U into another function space V. And that operator is continuous and the domain function space is compact. Now, I want to apologize that I'm changing the notation a little bit. I'm changing the symbols and I, I hate it when people do, do that to, uh, to the stuff that I have introduced and then I have to translate between my notation and their notation. Um, I apologize for that. I'm trying to, to make it uh, simpler for, for myself. So, um, so their 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 spatial variables x and y, the functions are u and v. I'm I'm, I'm trying to uh, to match uh, um, uh, to get the alphabet to be helpful uh, in terms of what's input, what's output. And under these conditions, that the map uh, G is continuous and the domain and the domain uh, function space is compact, you know this this result. Uh, it says that an arbitrarily close degree of approximation can be achieved with, um, with a deep on it um, approximation of that oper operator for all functions uh, in the compact input space. And this is it, I will not elaborate, uh, elaborate. I'm probably the least knowledgeable on this subject of all 70 plus uh, among us here but I will use it. So let's return to this, uh, this um, operator. This operator is given uh, implicitly. So certain things are not obvious. And the first, uh, is, what's obvious is, is uh, how to produce data. You, you simply uh, um, start with a sample set of betas and pr produce, a, um, pr produce a corresponding set of Ks and uh, and then proceed to train the uh, the approximate um, deep on net representation of the operator K. But uh, on the theory side, things need need to be um, um, established. The first thing to to establish is the continuity of um, this operator, and uh, that is established. More can be established, and I, I do state uh, more more than continuity. We establish that this uh, this implicitly given operator is uh, in fact Lipschitz on any compact set of imp input functions. And I'm being a little loose here. Uh, this is not enough for for compactness. Uh, you you need a bit more. For example, it's enough to uh, to assume that the functions beta are actually Lipschitz in, uh, in X, and then by, by the Arzella Ascoli theorem, you, get, uh, uh, you, you do get compactness uh, with, um, with the boundness. And then having established the continuity of this operator from beta to K, we just turn the crank on the deep on net universal approximation theorem, and we get this result, that for a compact set of functions of any, radius and for an arbitrarily small approximation error, uh, a deep on net approximation can be um, uh, produced. In fact, not only one, but millions of such approximations, which, which is relevant uh, to the control context, as I will emphasize later. Now, what is, how much error uh, is obtained? So for example, in, in, in our tests with a certain class of uh, functions, uh, which are in magnitude of the size of 10-ish, 
the error is on the order of 0.1. So that's, uh, that is good. What price do we pay? The price paid is in terms of the um, uh, number of parameters of the feedforward neural network, which is uh, in the on the order of a million. Let's uh, let's round it up. And what kind of functions uh, have we used for training? We've used the Chebyshev functions parameterized by uh, this parameter uh, gamma, which is probably common. They're rich enough. Uh, Rich looking, uh, rich enough looking functions to um, to perform um, parameterizations. How long does it take? Uh, well, on an older laptop, but with a GPU chip, the training, the whole thing takes about thirty seconds, and a single execution of the computation for a given function beta takes takes on the order of tenths of microseconds. Um, that even to you will look really short and the reasons can be many, you know, various good choices along the way using the GPU chip. And also the, the, the fact that the problem is maybe on the easy side of the spectrum of PD problems that we can consider. So as I said, this is an introductory uh, uh, problem and uh, you will see more challenging problems. But let me uh, get to the question that actually motivates my participation in this effort. And this is the stabilization of unstable PDs. Having found this approximation of the gains, are these gains uh, stabilizing? So, we're plugging these gains into the control law. And we're plugging them in the following way. We take some new PD and it's uh, recirculation coefficient function beta. We plug it into the approximated operator K hat. We obtain the approximate gain function, lowercase K hat. We plug that into the feedback law, which is an inner product between the state and the gain, and we feed that back continuously into the plant. Will that be stabilizing? So this is what we do. Replace the exact K by the deponet approximated K for a new beta. What do we get? So the analysis of stability of PD backstepping controller is performed with the target systems. And you've already seen that the, the exact target system is just the delay, the simple zero input transport PD. But with the deponent, there is an error. And this error introduces re recirculation. But this recirculation is proportional to the error between the outputs of the exact uh, backstepping operator and the approx deponent approximated operator. You see that this is essentially linear and it's intuitive that this, uh, the, the deponent theorem guaranteeing that this is going to be epsilon small, that the um, damaging effect of the recirculation can be made negligible. The question is how do you actually do that? And again, it's not trivial. So, the analysis, I'm breaking it down into roughly two, step, two manageable steps. One is the, the um, Lyapunov function estimation, and the other one is the rest of the stability analysis. So uh, we established first that this class of Lyapunov functions, which are exponentially weighted in space, that's important, is exponentially decaying in time. And this is so for sufficiently small values of epsilon used for the approximation of the exact operator uh, calligraphy K by the deponent approximation calligraphy K hat, where this epsilon is small enough in inverse proportion to the size of the, uh, of the coefficient functions of the PD. In other words, when you look at this relationship between B 
and epsilon, you see that the more unstable the system, uh, the tighter the deep one approximation needs to be. It makes sense, right? Uh, so now this, this was the first step, but the second step I want to show you is the main result. So the main result is the maintenance of stability in the original system variable u of xt. So what is this main result? Here it is. So uh, it says that for any class of PD coefficient functions, all the controllers resulting from the deep on net representations trained by with, under this sufficiently small error epsilon guarantee global exponential stability. Uh, and there is an overshoot here. This is not monotonically uh, approaching at all points x in the spatial inter, uh, interval. That's impossible even in the absence of the uh, deep on net error. So there is an overshoot coefficient and we give it explicitly uh, estimated here in terms of, uh, of the supremum uh, of the uh, recirculation function beta. So that's the first main result. Everything else from this point on is going to get more complicated, but this, this is what it is in the simplest case. So to, to remind you once again, why are we doing this? We're doing this because the system is unstable and we want to make it stable, but we want to avoid having to recompute the gain K for every new beta. Uh, let me now recap, what is, what is the method here? What is the big picture? The method consists in, in three major steps. The first step is the theoretical step. Uh, we have to derive the equation, that convolution uh, equation for the backstepping kernel. In the process of doing that, we need to pick the right target system. We need to, we need to introduce the Volterra transformation. We need to derive the equation to be solved for K. That's, that precedes this research. The next step is to learn the neural operator. And I want to emphasize here that learn the op neural operator is not something that you do every time. No. Think of this as being done once and for all. In other words, for the toy class of systems, uh, Luke, um, the collaborating PhD student on this, has already produced this, this, this operator essentially once and for all. It's only if you want to ex expand the set uh, of uh, the input uh, coefficients in magnitude or something like that, or in richness, that maybe it's not really once and for all. And finally, the use of this is in the implementation of the controller with the deep on that approximated kernel. So that's the method. Let's now move from functions uh, of, uh, of one variable to functions of more than one variable. And the uh, parabolic PDs will force us uh, into that. So the class of parabolic PDs for the ease of presentation will be rep represented by the reaction diffusion uh, problem where a second derivative in space arises and then there is this reaction term which can cause instability. The instability uh, in a reaction diffusion system typically is of a more boring kind, truly you know, monotonically, exponentially, um, uh, growing, and, and you see the numbers here, they're, they're, they're scary numbers, uh, for, for a couple of dif different Chebyshev parametrized uh, um, uh, 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 reaction functions lambda of x. Now, where's control? The control, again, is at the boundary, at, at one of the two boundaries of this reaction diffusion system, the boundary x equal to one, and that control input needs to be designed. You've already seen the backstepping method. Uh, Volterra transformation needs to be introduced. But for parabolic systems, it cannot be a Volterra transformation where, where the Volterra term is essentially uh, a convolution operator. It, the kernel truly has to be a function of two distinct variables, not a function of x minus y, just one variable. 
And the rest is essentially the same. The controller will be uh, evaluated with a gain uh, that is the um, kernel of the Volterra transformation with the X argument set to one. And the target system will be uh, the reaction diffusion equation without the reaction, namely uh, just the heat equation, which we all know is exponentially stable. So now the, the question, the key question is, what kind of K will perform this magical transformation into of the reaction diffusion equation into the heat equation with the input doing it from the boundary and the reaction that is domain wide uh, being uh, removed? Uh, can, I ask, can I ask a question? I think I think this uh, can generalize to all sorts of uh, conservation laws, like that uh, that they are subject to cold hop transformation, right? Not just a heat equation plus uh, the reaction term. You're you're uh, right. Yeah. You're you're right, George. Absolutely right. We have a paper uh, that does something to that effect uh, for a certain class of burgers like equations with viscosity though as i recall but also with a yeah, stable yeah, viscosity, reaction yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. and and the person the co-author there is is with us today rafael vasquez so okay. okay so what is what is the the k that that does this what what kind of a, a volterra kernel will make this possible it's a volterra kernel that satisfies a certain pd you see that there's no time in this pd there is space and space, X and Y. X and Y are, the, are sort of referred to the same physical space X. But uh, in this problem, X has a, has a, has a time-like role. If you see the, view this as, a, as a, some kind of a uh, wave equation, and Y has a space-like role. But it's, it's actually not good to think of this as a wave equation because the domain is not rectangular. Uh, the Volterra equation, uh, the Volterra operator is, is defined in a triangular way, and the domain here is not a rectangle, but a triangle. The space advances from zero length to a unit length in a time-like like fashion. This is called Gursa form PDs. And in this PD, which is on a triangle, the input function into the operator from lambda to k appears both additively here, which is, which is uh, the easy part, but also multiplicatively. And because of the multiplicative appearance, that ends up being a nonlinear mapping from lambda into k through a Gursa PD. So let me summarize. Lambda is a function of one variable. k is a function of two variables. I think this is interesting to note because the universal approximation theorem has covered such a rich set of uh, input and output uh, function space possibilities, and this one is is a little asymmetric. Uh, the output uh, functions are are more complex than the input functions. Dimension, least. So uh, to summarize, now we have a transformation and a controller, and now we're replacing. Uh, the exact kernel K by the deponent approximated kernel K hat. Uh, and we're doing this in the design. And we do the training, I will, I will spare you the, the repetition. And at the end of the day, we need to do a stability analysis. And the stability analysis is done on the target system, but the target system has now been contaminated by the approximation error from the deponent replacing the exact um, uh, kernel. So we have to account for this dangerous, potentially destabilizing error stuff delta. What is, and you see now that it appears more generally, it appears both, both as a reaction-like term and as, uh, as uh, through a Volterra uh, uh, triangular uh, term, non-local effect on the, on the PD. Exactly what are these deltas? They're given by these expressions. They do depend on k minus k hat, the approximation error. But they depend not only on k minus k hat, but also on some derivatives of k minus k hat. So this brings into play another 
degree of freedom or richness in the deep one approximation theorem. And that's not that's that not only uh, does it allow to um, to have input and output function spaces of different dimensions, but also of totally different regularity. Specifically, our input our input function is lambda, but our our output function is not just k of lambda. It's k of lambda plus these two additional functions with the uh, with the derivatives. So it's a triple. It's an output uh, uh, triplet. And because of the derivatives, you note that even if lambda uh, is just continuous, you're going to have to prove for k uh, that it's C2. And we prove that. This is step one. I will spare you the details of the proof, but uh, that's, that's, that's an interesting portion of of, uh, of all of this because it's it's a study of that Bursa PD. Step two is apply the deep on uh, approximation theorem. And it's as before, I'm showing it now for the third time, an error between the exact and the deep on approximated operator can be made uh, smaller than any epsilon by an approx appropriately constructed deep on net. So we have that and now Okay, so uh, and and just to to um, to before I proceed to the stability discussion, let me just just illustrate what these k's might look like. So for one type of a lambda function, k might be a function that is huge but monotonic. For yet another type of a lambda function. K might not be that that huge, but it might be non-monotonic. This is just just a maybe a redundant, obvious um, uh, illustration, but it's always help, helpful uh, to add some images to to equations. So now, uh, for the function of one variable in the hyperbolic case, we had uh, we had about seven hundred thousand parameters here. Uh, it's it's about a hundred times more parameters in a feed forward um, in, in, in this uh, CNN plus uh, FNN uh, representation. We're still talking about the Chebyshev um, parameterizations of the lambda functions. Uh, and the execution of the deep on net evaluation for any new uh, lambda function of the trained deep on net uh, takes again on the order of less than a um, uh, millisecond. Again, that's thanks thanks to it being done on a on a GPU. If you take take a laptop without a GPU, and let's say it's an older laptop, how bad will it will get? It'll still be under a millisecond, uh, but the training time might might take several hours. And I'm mentioning this because various kinds of results may be reported in this forum. Uh, on, on different types of hardware and on different types of uh, parallelized computing architecture. So the result of interest to me, the retention of, of, of stability is given next. And that result says that, that for, um, for any reaction diffusion uh, system with uh, the deep on it trained for given bounds on lambda and lambda prime, the derivative of lambda in x, uh, all the resulting controllers from all the possible deep on at approximations for uh, epsilon under some epsilon star are exponentially stabilizing and the um, overshoot coefficient is, is given here. Um, and, and this, this proof results uh, consists of, of a Lyapunov analysis first, and then analysis of the norm equivalence between the target system and the original system, which involves the backstepping transformation and its inverse, and the backstepping and its inverse involve the kernel, and the kernel is being approximated. So there are quite a few steps to, to, to get us to, uh, to this, but we uh, get there. Uh, and when we implement it, we get what we 
spent this time, all this time to get, and that's exponential stabilization. And it looks depressingly boring in the parabolic uh, case, but the open loop system was, was quite uh, aggressively unstable, but it's stabilized uh, by this approximate uh, deep on that feedback. Uh, I will skip the so-called uh, observers. Uh, it's quite similar. If you know how to design controllers, you can, um, you can convert that into an ability to design state estimators where uh, rather than controlling from a boundary, you only sense from the boundary, but estimate the state uh, in the domain exponential. I will, I will skip, uh, skip the detail here. Uh, there's another question uh, that is maybe uh, more distinct than the observer question. And that's the question, well, if you can approximate the map from beta to k, which is function to function, but your end goal is to apply a controller, which is a scalar valued control whose value is u, then why don't you approximate the map not only from beta to k, but from beta and the measured state u of x, so from beta of x and u of x into the scalar input value u. Why don't you do that? Well, it can be done. Let me let me show it very very briefly. And the result is sufficiently distinct that that it's it's uh, worth considering. So back to the same um, pedagogical hyperbolic problem. And this is just a reminder in a different notation that is now customized to, to, to this new question, a reminder of what the, the scalar input is. The scalar input is a mapping, is, is, is a scalar out of a mapping into scalars from two functions, the model coefficient beta and the state function u of x at all points in time. I'm suppressing time here because all of this uh, holds uh, point-wise uh, in time without any memory. So that's the mapping. Two functions into a scalar. Or rather, a functional, because it's scalar valued from uh, two continuous functions. So first, we need to establish the, the, uh, the continuity of that mapping and then uh, apply the deep on that theorem, and, and we do that. This, is, this gets a bit more, more a bit more complicated to, to establish, but uh, it is established. And then what's the end result? This is the main thing that is different. The end result is that stability is retained under approximation, but with some loss. First, the perfect uh, exponential stabilization to zero uh, is lost and a small residual error is introduced. This error is proportional to the training accuracy um, epsilon for the deep one at. It shouldn't be surprising. And the reason why there is this, this loss of, uh, um, uh, why there's a, a loss of perfect stabilization is that while the gain appeared in the control law multiplicatively. Let me remind you. The gain k of beta appeared multiplicatively. Now, uh, the um, convolution of k and u affects u additively. So there is a persistent error. It's, it's, it's not a vanishing error. So this is the first minor loss. And the second loss is the loss in globality we no longer get uh, the stability result to hold for all initial conditions, but it holds for all initial conditions uh, in a ball of initial conditions that is proportional to the size of the training set relative to the state U. And that again should be expected uh, after one second of maybe disappointment that the result is semi-global in other words, it can be made as large as possible as long as you, you train for uh, functions u of a huge magnitude. What is the, what is the price of uh, expanding the region of attraction and uh, shrinking the residual set? It's a large training set and more NNN, uh, neural network nodes. 
uh, as expected. So what are the simulation results? This is the open loop unstable result and under feedback, uh, we get stabilization. You can't tell that there is a little bit of error, but there is an error. There is a little bit of error, both in the input and in the state. So why, uh, why are we really doing all of this? Because uh, so far I've shown you only um, the employment of the deep on net in an offline fashion. We developed the deep on net through the offline solutions of the KPD. And then I produced the K hat in a single offline evaluation of K hat for a new beta. So who cares if, if we reduce the offline computation from, uh, from seconds to microseconds? Now, so that's not the point of, of all of this. We're just getting to the point of all of this. This research has so far you know, lasted for a little more than two months. And we're, we're just getting, getting from, from laying the foundations to, to the punchline. Uh, there are two punchlines. One is in uh, developing game scheduling controllers for nonlinear or time varying PDs. And the other punchline is adaptive control uh, with real time um, learning. So, what is the state of the art in control of general nonlinear PDs? It is dismal. Uh, the one general result that exists uh, is actually a result by Rafael Vasquez, who is here. It's a super impressive result. It's, it's, it's a result that is essentially the PD equivalent of the general feedback linearization in which Volterra infinite, uh, infinite uh, Volterra series operators are employed for the state transformation, which was the capital T in uh, Konstantinos's talk. But here it's a, it's a spatial nonlinear operator from the state U into a target state uh, W. Uh, I really encourage taking a look at these, these, these papers. They, uh, they teach you uh, things that you sh probably shouldn't try again because of how complex it is to do this stabilization exactly. This is not, not method dependent. This is, this is, this is the simplest way, way to do it. And yet it's hopelessly uh, complex because you have these Voltaire operators with kernels that are functions of an increasing number of variables. And by increasing, I mean with no limit except, except that you can truncate uh, um, if, if you want. And then these PDs need to be studied the, the convergence of the infinite series need to be uh, estimated. And that's just the, the, the accuracy of the transformation. Then you have to go into, into the stability analysis with all these, these estimates. That's why it takes two full papers to, um, uh, to, to present it. So that's, that's really not a usable answer to, to that. So we need to, uh, to back off from, from this into uh, more, um, um, to, into simpler solutions. And one classical alternative to exact um, nonlinear control is gain scheduling, the so-called poor man's nonlinear control. Uh, my one attempt at this, uh, and the one attempt I know of for, for gain scheduling for uh, uh, nonlinear PDs is this, this particular paper. So let me illustrate what, what I have in mind when I say gain scheduling for, for PDs. I mean, Let's go back again to that pedagogical example, but let's now suppose uh, that it's actually nonlinear, that the recirculation uh, depends, the, the circulation of the outlet depends on the size of, of, of on the magnitude of the uh, outlet. So this is the simplest nonlinear situation. So what changes in the deep on it? Well, first the kernel, um, convolution equation is, is now dependent on a second variable, which is this u, this scalar u, which, um, uh, which is any real. I don't know why, how I lost uh, the symbol for reals. Um, so, um, uh, so, so it's actually two, uh, training in two variables, and then the implementation of the uh, deep net approximation for feedback. So how does that work? 
uh, no analysis completed yet, but how does it work? So in open loop, the recirculation will cause instability, but we've taken here uh, a system where the instability is not uh, growing exponentially without limit, but it settles into a limit cycle. I think it's more realistic. Uh, so you see this, this complex periodic uh, quasi steady state behavior. We want to suppress that and bring it down to zero. Suppose we take a linearization of that system and apply the control, the linear controller from the beginning of this talk. That linear feedback will fail for, for, uh, because it applies only to infinitesimal uh, initial conditions. But if we apply the gain scheduler where K is being scheduled in proportion or K hat is being scheduled in proportion to, to the outlet value, then we achieve stabilization. And the most interesting part is the how stabilization is achieved. And that's displayed in maybe this most important uh, slide in this talk and uh, essentially the final slide. Uh, you see how as the time progresses, the gaze scheduling morphs the kernel function. The initial kernel function is for x equals zero. It's a function of x. And by the time you've succeeded, gaze scheduling has uh, adjusted this kernel function to this to totally different shape and shifted it um, downward. Uh, I am out of time. I will skip the adaptive. This is also super uh, interesting. Let me, let me sk skip it. I have several rhetorical questions to myself. Uh, a PD control person might reason. So you're doing some approximations here. Is that essentially another formal model reduction? And the answer is absolutely not. Absolutely not. You, you can pose the same, you have to pose the same problem for model reduction. And it, it would be a, a, not an operator problem, but it would be a function problem because you, you've gone into an uh, ODE representation of the, of the PD. And you couldn't even uh, do it because for uh, any different system, you're going to have uh, uh, a reduced model of a, of a different uh, uh, appropriate order for control. Is it model free? No, it's not at all model free. It's very model based. It's, it's a deep on net representation of something that comes from from uh, extensive efforts in, in control theory. Another question, can I still do it simpler? Can I just, just, just set all, of, all the 20 years of work aside and do it, do it and, and learn these backstepping controllers? The answer is you, 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 can, you cannot because, uh, because the GURSA PD and its approximation is crucial to this. You can't do it over finite time. Uh, so, just just to just to recap maybe this this can be just like i've seen graph informed neural networks in addition to pin maybe this can be uh, thought of as control control informed because it's informed by all the theoretical uh investments uh of the of the past the acronym uh is pronounced sin i i hope you see it more virtuous than sinful uh, and uh, just to, 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 um, to recap, uh, all of this is uh, accomplished at, at, at very, very reasonable uh, computational cost. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, do we have questions, comments from the audience? Thank you, Miroslav. That was very pedagogical. I finally understood a little bit of control theory. And uh, <laughs> so, thank you, George. Great, uh, good to see, actually. I just have a question, uh, uh, not a question, but uh, uh, just a uh, common question. I don't know. It's uh, we have a new operator, it's called the Laplace neural operator, uh, a paper we published recently. Uh, so, so you may have heard of Fourier neural operator, so which basically, um, uh, it, it's uh, it's not like the trunk, the branch of the trunk, but it, you uh, are limited to a certain you know, Fourier transform. Now we replace the Fourier transform with Laplace transform. So I was on was wondering if the LNO, what we call Laplace neural operator, may be appropriate for this type of systems. But of course, 
uh, we haven't figured out exactly what LNO is good for. Uh, we know that it's good uh, for systems that have transient behavior compared to FNO, for example, or depot net. So, so that, you may want to take a look at that. It, it's in yeah. the archive. It's the LNO uh, is the acronym, and it's a, it's a recent work, so we haven't really fully evaluated. But uh, of course, it's a superset of Fourier neural operator because it has also the real part in the transform. But otherwise, it's a relatively simple structure. That's that's terrific. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so first of all, I'm familiar with FNO. Uh, Yuan Yuan Shi uh, comes from the Caltech group. We've considered FNO. We've used used it without developing theory. Uh, uh, we note that uh, its best uses are in situations with uh, periodic functions, uh, and for systems that have for operators that have an important temporal component. We very, uh, by the way, I haven't heard of, of the uh, LNO. I'll look it up. Uh, we just, yeah, we just published it like a month ago, a couple of months ago. That's, that's fantastic because potentially this is the answer to some of our questions. And our questions are the following. Uh, so far you've seen operators acting only on spatial on functions of space, but in control theory, we have functions of time as well. We have dynamical feedback laws. For example, we have um, observers, which are mappings of the initial condition and time into the current estimate. We have system identification where there are update laws of uh, estimating the unknown parameters in real time. These are mappings from the initial estimates of the unknown parameters and time into the current estimates. Uh, and uh, uh, we need the best tool for these uh, for these operators as well. Uh, it one thing is is intuitive that oh, as the time expands, um, that uh, the neural network might require more and more nodes if this is done. Uh, in a fashion that does not um, exploit well the structure, and maybe the the Laplace uh, operators are the right tool for uh, for that. But but that's our next next horizon: getting getting to to dynamical uh, operators because these have all been static operators, even though the systems are dynamical. But the operators are 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 uh, are pointwise in time; they're not dependent on time. Uh, Zogren, I think he put on the chat, he put the reference. Yeah, so, so yeah just uh, put the link to the Alan uh, Laplace neural operator paper in the chat. So, Professor, you, you may want to check it out. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, let me let, let me not delay, Jerome. Uh, no, no, but uh, let's take uh, maybe if there's uh, one or two questions so we can take them. Uh, Jerome can wait. He's, uh, he's a local kid. Hi, Miroslav. This is uh, Jerome uh, Dabon from Brown. Could you elaborate a bit more about um, the question that George asked about the Berger's equation and uh, how you would modify the approach or how it could apply? So uh, we have one, uh, we have uh, not uh, looked at the Berger's equation alone with the Kohlhoff transformation specifically. Uh, we, uh, because, uh, um, because if all there is to, to it is introducing the Hoff Kohl transformation, uh, is there even a paper out of, out of that? I'm not sure. We've, we've looked at a problem where the Burgess equation is made unstable. So you need to act uh, in, in a more complex fashion. And uh, what would otherwise be Hof Kohl is another kind of a Volterra-like nonlinear uh, transformation. It's a series of two papers by Rafael Vasquez, me, and a French student. Rafael, if, if you remember his name, uh, help me, please. <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, it was Lionel. Um, hmm. Oh, Lionel. Lionel. Yes. Uh, Manis. Lionel Manis. Yes. 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 Okay. okay. <laughs> From a golden name. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Any more questions for Miroslav? He has to run, but uh, maybe one more question. Okay, maybe uh, yeah, maybe we can. Start. Thank you very much. Thank Miroslav. you, so uh, There is um, there is a great interest. I just got uh, very recently an email from uh, Fariba Fakhru from Air Force R, and she wants to make uh, pins and controls and deponet and so on part of the of their portfolio at, at the computational math group and also uh, Fred uh, Lev from uh, Air Force. So they want to to have this uh, exactly exact. So uh, let's see if we can organize a uh, maybe maybe you can be um, a guest speaker in the annual uh, meeting for the grantees. I think this will be um, uh, Fariba herself is um, is uh, working in this field. So she's uh, I, I contacted her. She could make a live the live talks but she said she will listen to the uh, uh to the youtube version uh today or, or mm -hmm. over the weekend so but thanks very much i will i will follow up with uh, with that i i i agree i i think that the neural operators are game changing and 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 uh you know boundary uh removing uh as a tool and uh, and thank you so much again for having me yeah great great listen to that. Uh, uh, Zogren, maybe you can proceed with uh, the third talk. All right, thank you. Uh, so yeah, so now we move to our uh, third talk, uh, given by Professor Jerome Darbin, who is an associate professor at the Division of Applied Mathematics at Hewitt Brown University. Uh, his research is on developing efficient solvers for high-dimensional HDPDs, and that find applications in open control, differential games, immune science, and also scientific machine learning. So, Jerome, you may want to uh, start. Hello. Uh, you, you, your screen is frozen, I think. So now I, what I see is you know, Jerome Darwin is starting to share a screen. You may want to, yeah, start over. My Zoom has an issue. Let me try to do it again. Sure. Is it working? Yes, yes, now we can see the okay. series, yeah. All right, okay. Thank you very much, Zongran, for the introduction. So today I want to talk about the Lego Squank with George Kiyadakis and two of my students, Paula Chen and Ting Weimeng and Zongran Zhu, who's a student of George. This work has been supported by um, the, uh, Murray and Paula Chen has been uh, supported by a DOD Smart um, Fellowship. So we do recognize that machine learning uh, results and especially scientific machine learning problems have been able to solve very challenging scientific problems when traditional methods cannot. So the list is very long and uh, these are very impressive uh, results. However, we identify essentially here in this talk two challenges in scientific machine learning we, where one of them is what about the interpretation of the methods that we are creating, and also that learning this or training uh, these neural networks may be computationally uh, expensive. The main point of this talk is to consider a subclass of a machine learning problem that rise from scientific um, application, and we develop a novel theoretical connections that is based on observing that certain optimization problems that arise in machine learning can be actually connected to what we call a multi-time hop formula that corresponds to a solution to a certain hamilton jacobi PDEs that is at the same time connects to certain optimal control problems. So through these theoretical connections involving hamilton jacobi PDE, we will be able to leverage the machinery that has been established for solving optimal control problems, and we use it to solve certain machine learning problems. At the same time, this novel theoretical connection will allow us to interpret 
what the machine learning problem is doing through the lenses of Hamilton Jacobi PDE. Let me give you a very high level um, description of how the thing works. At the bottom, we have certain machine learning problems that we're going to connect to some formulas that are known as variational representation formulas involved for Hamilton Jacobi PDEs. And these Hamilton Jacobi PDEs are connected to the certain uh, optimal control problems for which we have efficient algorithm. So when we go up, we get a new insights about what those machine learning methodologies are doing. So we can provide an interpretation in view of the solutions to Hamilton Jacobi PDEs. And one of the options that we get from computational perspectives is that we can reuse algorithms from these optimal control problems and use them for solving machine learning problems. And so we am going to give you examples where we can get some computational advantages and memory advantages by using this new path, leveraging optimal control algorithms that have been developed for decades. A more precise point of view of what's going on in this talk is as follows. At, uh, on the left, we have the classical classes of machine learning problem. So we can first look at the middle row on the left, where we have regularized linear regression problem. What we're going to do is to get an equivalence between this formulation of certain machine learning problems to a representation formula of a Hamilton Jacobi PDE that will be amenable to a certain class of optimal control problem known as linear quadratic regulator, LQR for short, that will lead us to the classical algorithm for solving this LQR problems that are known as the Riccati equation as mentioned by Miroslav in the last talk. And we will be able to get not only one solution for those guys, but the flow of solutions that we will be able to connect to dynamic, uh, dynamics related to the original optimal control problems when we change some hyperparameters. Another generalization of the learning problem is when we try to learn using more general losses than for the quadratic case, and we still have the connection using uh, Hamilton Jacobi PDEs and optimal control problem, but as of today, we do not have the efficient algorithms. So I'm going to focus first on that guy and tell you how the whole machinery works for connecting these uh, machine learning problems that arise from scientific applications to Hamilton Jacobi PDE, to Riccati equations, and how they can be leveraged to solve um, certain problems that arise in scientific machine learning. So what we get in this talk is a new interpretation of machine learning in the lens of Hamilton Jacobi PDEs. So what we can get is an increase of interpretability of these neural networks, in particular pins. And we can leverage a subclass of these problems related to the LQR theory for which we have efficient solvers based on Riccati um, uh, ODEs. And uh, I will illustrate you how we can leverage these connections through Riccati based solvers for certain class of optimum uh, machine learning problems such as continual learning, post training calibration and so on and so on. I want to emphasize um, at the beginning of this talk that to our knowledge this connection is novel, but yet it has several limitations because we consider as a first step only regularized uh, linear regression problems arising in machine learning that connects to a subclass of um, optimal control problems that are essentially linear. And we need to explore further in detail Nonlinear models um, arising in uh, machine learning, more general convex Hamiltonians, 
and nonlinear dynamics arising in control and so on. So the outline of the talk is as follows. I'm going to briefly review uh, multi-time Hamilton Jacobi PDEs and the celebrated uh, variational representation formula known as OPF that will allow us to connect formally certain problems arising in scientific machine learning um, to uh, Hamilton Jacobi PDE using the multi tie up formula, and uh, it will yield an associated optimal control problem. Then we will specialize this uh, formula and these problems for the case of optimal control problems that becomes the NQR problem, and that will allow us to derive some numerical methodologies um, for machine learning application that will give efficient algorithm both in, both in terms of speed and memory usage. So for instance, we can add a point in a data set or we can remove it. We can fine tune uh, the terms for the data fitting, same thing for the regularization and we can even extend our approach for convex um, regularization term. And each of these features that are obtained from the theoretical uh, point of view will have application in machine learning that I described here on the right. So let's start with, oops, sorry. Let's start with the, the classical first order deterministic Hamilton Jacobi PDE that is given uh, above. So you search for a function S. I use here the notation of physics. S is denotes the action and H is the Hamiltonian. And in general, your Hamiltonian depends on space X times T and then the special gradient of the solution that is called the momentum. And you are given an initial data times T equals zero that I'm going to denote here by J. So this kind of PDE is originally arised um, from physics, but then uh, they also pop up in control, imaging sciences and so on and so on. It is very well known that the solution to this Hamilton Jacobi PDE relates to an optimal control problem written here in the middle, where the optimal control problem has two terms. First, you have a terminal cost, J of XT, where XT will uh, be in the solution to this ODE, where time in T equals zero, you start at some space, X. Then you have this ODE um, of, uh, of X, and U is the control. And you have in the objective function what we call a running cost in optimal control, that is the uh, integral from zero of, uh, to T of a Lagrangian that depends on X, uh, S, and the control. So if you are able to solve this Hamilton Jacobi PDE, or you are able to solve this uh, optimal control problem, they have the same value. And if you are able to solve the Hamilton Jacobi PDE above as well as its gradient, then you can recover the control through the Hamiltonian by solving this optimization problem. This is the um, high level point of view of how optimal control problems and Hamilton Jacobi PDEs are connected to each other. We can extend the class of problems um, that we have by simply not extending, specializing um, the optimal control problem and the Hamilton Jacobi PDE that we have, where, for instance, we consider that the Hamiltonian only depends on the momentum and there is no space, no time dependence in the Hamiltonian. In that case, the viscosity solution of this PDE is given by the solution of an optimization problem that reads as follows on the left. Equivalently, you have uh, the formulation as a minimization problem. And then those variational formulas are known as the up formula that um, corresponds to the viscosity solution to S. Here, I denote J star to be the Fenchel Legend transform of the um, function J, the initial data, and it's given again using convex analysis um, by the following formula that corresponds to solving an optimization problem. And for this specialization, the uh, associated optimal control problem reads like this. 
So now you control your ODE that is given by f of u of s when u is the control. The Lagrangian depends only on the control and you have the initial um, uh, data of the PDE that corresponds to the terminal cost in the optimal control problem. And as usual, the Hamiltonian is given by this formula, which is essentially a nonlinear version of um, the Lagrangian that acts through F. We can extend this point of view of single time Hamilton Jacobi PDE by considering a system of Hamilton Jacobi PDE. So, what's happening here, T before was a single time, it was a real value. Now we're going to see T as a vector. So, we do not have only one time, we have many times here, big N times. And for each time, I'm going to write a Hamilton Jacobi PDE that is associated to one of the time, Ti, associated to one Hamiltonian. And then we have a coupling between all those guys through the initial condition where the solution at any vector x in our n for all times to be zero has to be the uh, initial data in j. So this system of hamilton jacobi PDEs under some assumption on h and j, um, are known to have a representation formula that is called the multi-time hop formula, which is essentially a generalization of what we had before, where we still have the scalar product, we still have the financial transform of the initial data, and now instead of having a TIHI, I have a sum of the TIHI. So this is a generalization of the hop formula, we call it the multi-time hop formula, and it is a viscosity representation solution of the system of Hamilton Jacobi PDEs given above. Similarly, we can get a connection to optimal control problem using multi times. So now, what we have is we do not have one running cost, but we have what we call a piecewise running cost. For each time, you go from one to the other one. You're going to integrate over this series of times a Lagrangian Li that depends on the control U, and then you pay the optimal terminal cost uh, J of XT. In terms of dynamics for this uh, optimal control problem, what we get is that we do not have only one ODE. I mean, we have only one ODE, but the Fi are defined in terms of this. Uh, time interval being given by each of the multi time. And as before, we can generate each of the Hamiltonian using the classical formula. So when big N equals one, we recover the case of classical optimal control, but um, using multi time, we can get a more general formulation. And these are the associated formulas for the viscosity solution and for the optimal control. So now what we're going to do is to connect these uh, multi-time um, hamilton Jacobi PDEs and especially the variational up representation formula to, the, to certain classes of scientific machine learning programs. So the, the, the general formulation that we're going to consider in this paper is as follows, which is the typical formulation for a machine learning problem you are given some data AY and ZI. Your goal is to learn some parameters F, let's say of a neural network that are defined by a big F and theta are the parameters. A could be an operator that acts on your operator. For instance, like in pins, it could be a differential operator. You measure the discrepancy that you have between uh, the neural network that is trying to provide the, the exact solution using the data zi and the parameter theta to what you observe, yi. You can, uh, so this is a loss for each of the data sets. You can weigh those, loss, um, those losses by parameters lambda i, and then you sum all of those. And we can add a regularization on the parameters of the neural network. 
it turns out that when you have this um, class of a machine learning problem, you can get a formal identification of what's going on. You have at the bottom, the machine learning formulation of the problem. So we call that the minimal loss. What do you have? You minimize over the weight, some uh, hyperparameters lambda i, you have the data feeding loss, and you have a rigorization. This is given as below using the formalism that we had in terms of formula. And now we have formal correspondences between the up formula that is given in the middle row of each graph. We see that we can interpret the hyperparameters lambda i as many ti's. The losses that we have in the machine learning problem will be associated to the Hamiltonian hi. So each loss li will be associated to hi of a new variable that we're going to call p. The regularization term will be written in terms of the up formula as two terms, a certain convex function j star minus a linear term in p. And the analogy continues. If once you have the um, up formula associated to this uh, machine learning problem, we can create the optimal control formulation. So the HI will give you the Lagrangian that you consider. Then the integration in time will be given by the TIs that we got from the lambda i in the machine learning problem. And the uh, terminal, uh, the regularization will be related to the terminal cost and also to where you start the evolution of your optimal control problem. And the Hamiltonian also gives you naturally the dynamics that are considered um, for the optimal control problem. So this is the general picture where we are able to formally recognize that every time you have a machine learning problem given on this form, it can be associated just by using different notations to, as the solution, as a multi-time hop formula that corresponds to a viscosity solution to a multi-time Hamilton Jacobi PD, which in turns is associated to an optimal control problem. So what we're going to do now is to take this general formulation and specialize it for the case of optimal control problems that are linear quadratic regulators and that will essentially correspond to consider a regularized linear, linear regression problems in machine learning. So the LQR problem corresponds to setting all Hamiltonians and all uh, terminal condition to be quadratic functions. The dynamics uh, of the ODE are linear. So this is um, a problem that has been well studied and it's really a subclass of uh, optimal control problem in the sense that you control a linear ODE and all the running costs are quadratic and all the terminal costs are quadratic. So we know that you can create, uh, that um, the minimal value of this optimal control problem satisfies a hamilton jacobi PD, and you have an explicit formula where you have uh, an explicit formula for the Hamiltonian that are expressed in terms of the matrices, some, some matrices and some vectors. What we get when we consider only one uh, time, a single time, so it means we have this um, uh, LQR problem, we have the following associated Hamilton Jacobi PD, where the Hamiltonian takes this form. It's a quadratic term. What we can do. Once you have this um, LQR problem, it is well known in the optimal control um, literature 
that this problem can be solved by solving a system, a system of ODEs known as the Riccati ODEs, as Miroslav uh, showed in his slide at the beginning of his talk. And the uh, Riccati equations read like this. In other words, if you are able to solve the Riccati ODEs, then you are able to solve the associated optimal control problem and you are able to solve the hamilton jacobi uh, PDE associated to it. So when you specialize the general connection that I presented before to the special case of AQR problem, then we're gonna see that it connects to a single point regularized linear equation. Indeed, since we are in single time, we have only one time here and a single time, then the um, Riccati equation and the solution um, to this hamilton jacobi PD reads like this. That is, and that corresponds to a loss that is given above. And the regularization that we put on the parameters here are associated to these guys in terms of the up formula and we can associate um, the associated uh, optimal control problems. So here A is seen as a data and we have only one data. And if you have only one data and you want to solve this problem, then it corresponds to solving this hamilton jacobi PDE using the up formula that is associated to solving this optimal control problem. So, Theta star in the solution of the machine learning problem. It is exactly the solution to the up formula in the middle. That, uh, that solution is exactly the special gradient of S. And using the Riccati equation, we know that we have this representation. So now we need to choose either you are using machine learning methods to get the theta or you are using the hamilton jacobi PDE to get the solution, solution theta star by computing P star, or you can use Riccati equation to get the theta star. And this is what we're going to leverage in this talk. We can, of course, extend uh, all we did for LQR into a multi-time LQR problem. So as before, instead of having one time T, now we have a collection of times Ti that we see as a vector uh, where each entry contains all the time zone that we want. And the key thing here is that instead of having A that was a scalar um, in single time, now we have a collection uh, of um, AI that we see as a vector and those guys are going to become our observed data in the machine learning problem. So as before, once uh, we have this up formula, we can associate it to a system of hamilton jacobi PDEs that we call uh, multi-time hamilton jacobi PDEs. And it turns out that this uh, optimal control problem that arises as a multi-time LQR problem that can be also interpreted as a LQR problem that are piecewise LQR in time. We can solve it using a system of uh, Riccati ODEs where everything is indexed by the times, TI, but essentially it's a sequence of LQR problems where for each interval of time, TI, TI plus one or TI, TI minus one, we have a Riccati equation to solve and for which we can use many efficient solvers. So what we get now is when you simplify all the formulas above you have the um, machine learning problem, it corresponds to a regularized linear regression problem where you observe data are AI. So now you have big N of those. And again, you have the identification to the up formula that is associated to the following um, 
piecewise IQ1 problem on each time interval. And as before, you can solve the original uh, machine learning problem by getting theta star, or you can solve for the Hamilton Jacobi PD, or you can solve for the Riccati equations. If you are able to do one of those, then you are solving the other problems. So, well, uh, what's happening in that? We have this original learning problem. So as before, we have some observed data Xi, then what do we want to do? We want to approximate uh, what we observe theta i using some basis functions phi i. And our goal is to learn the coefficients of um, these uh, basis representation to approximate um, the observed data. And we have uh, a regularization on the parameters. So we have uh, this optimization problem in terms of theta, and then we have the parameters lambda i that makes each of the quadratic loss. We also have uh, a parameter to rate um, the regularization term. And here, the theta k naught corresponds to a bias that we want to have on the parameters of the learning method. So in that case, again, we look at the general formulation and specialize it for the case of interest um, in this example. And what do we get in that? We have the correspondence between machine learning problem, uh, representation of the um, hamilton jacobi PDEs, and uh, the corresponding optimal control problem. We know that the solution to the multi-time hamilton jacobi PDEs is a quadratic that can be solved using the Riccati Ricat equations that are given below. So what we do in order to solve for those, we're going to numerically integrate the Riccati ODEs uh, using a classical uh, rank kuta method of uh, order four, but other approach could be done to solve the Riccati equations that will give us the solution to the hamilton jacobi PDE that will give us the solution to the optimum machine learning problem. So once you solved for the Riccati equation, you get the right-hand side. It means you obtain the gradient, special gradient of your multi-time Hamilton Jacobi PD solution. So it means you have the solution to the machine learning problem. And this is the methodology that we're going to exploit here. So what can you do? Well, once you have these connections, then we can consider different problems that arise in machine learning. So for instance, you could say, uh, you could consider the following setup. You assume that you solve your, your machine learning problem for data sets that has big N uh, entries. And now we want to resolve the same problem with the same data sets plus one data. So instead of having n data, you keep your n data and then you add another one. What you're going to do is you're going to update the data feeding term by adding this quadratic term. And what's going to happen in terms of the multi-time Hamilton Jacobi PD is that you're going to add a specific Hamiltonian for which we have an exact, um, an explicit solution. And then it means that we're going to add pieces to a Lagrangian for the new time Tn, Tn plus one. And now we have to solve this uh, new system of uh, Riccati equation for this new IQR problem. But the upshot is that we don't have to resolve everything because since we already had the solution for N data points, what we have to do is to simply do 
uh, we simply need to solve the Riccati equation for the new interval uh, Tn to Tn plus one. So instead, again, of solving again the original problem um, using all the data points, all we have to do is to um, look at the solution that we obtain for the first n data points. Then we do only one step of um, the Riccati equation associated to the new data. And this is it, we get the optimal solution. So one of the main upshots of this point of view is that in order to train for this new data set, when we add uh, another point, we do not need any access to the previous data because we already have the solution uh, of interest to, to us through the Riccati equation up to the n first data sets. And therefore it allows us to design a method to train this new data set using the result of the previous one, using much less computations and um, by saving a lot of memory. So- Ron, can I make a, a, a comment here? Because you, you uh, refer in the beginning to continual learning. And this yep. is exactly the issue with the continual learning. You don't have access to previous data. That's the idea. So then, and also the forgetting and so on, but this is, I think this is what you were referring to continual learning, right? This point, this point here. Yeah. This is exactly the example that is going right after that. You're right. Any other comments, questions? No, thank you. Yeah. So as uh, exactly um, uh, George said, a typical application of this setup is in continual learning. So why uh, essentially you want to learn a function, but you only get the data in a stream. And as, uh, as when you receive new data, then you want to retrain your model using the available data, but you do not want to look at the past data in order to mitigate the amount of memory and computations that you have to do. And so as data income, and becomes available, you want to update um, those models. So this is a setup that uh, we have. We want to learn these functions. We are given some uh, noisy uh, measurements. We prescribe the time step for the model. We are given a set of uh, basis functions and we are given here end data. So you assume that at a uh, time, um, and delta t, then you have access to the data, and then this is what we want to solve. What we're going to do is to not solve this problem, but we use the methodology that uh, we covered uh, before. We're going to solve the first NQR problem for the first data, and when it becomes available, and the next data becomes available, then we're not going to reuse the data, we're going to reuse the solution um, that we computed before, and efficiently uh, solve this optimization problem for the new data and so on and so on. So this is an evolution of what's happening in terms of the coefficients uh, used in the basis. So all of them are supposed to be zero except two of them given here. And here I give you the evolution of each of the, the coefficients using a color coded uh, figure when more and more data becomes um, available. And eventually we see that given enough data, then uh, we're able to correctly identify the coefficients of the basis to solve the problem. So what's happening? Well, this is an illustration of um, a continual learning setup using the example that I gave before. So in uh, black, you have the exact function that we want to learn. In a uh, little blue, uh, uh, light blue, then this is the historical data. The star in blue is the new data that come, uh, comes in at the specific time. And then in red, you have the prediction done by the neural network. And on the left, middle and right, I give you what are um, those uh, guys. When we have on the left 200 data, 
400 uh, data and 800 data. So as we get more data, then we see that the prediction that we are making using this um, machine learning approach gets more and more accurate. One of the upshot, and this is really um, oops, important to see, is that in that case of continual learning, then we are able to update the model as more data arrives without the need to access to previous data. We don't need that. We don't, do not retrain on the entire data set. We only need to update um, our prediction by integrating um, the uh, Riccati equation for a new uh, time step using Wang de Kuta. And so it provides an advantage both in terms of memory and computations of a traditional uh, continual uh, learning method. So again, we have several advantage, advantage when, uh, that we can leverage using our Riccati uh, based approach. We do not need to access the data again. We can save memory and computations. And we can also see through um, the theory that uh, the proposed met method here completely avoids the catastrophic forgetting because we always use the knowledge, uh, we always keep the knowledge of the data that we see through the solution given by the Riccati ODEs. So in that sense, we do not have this uh, catastrophic forgetting where we may have an abrupt degradation of performance uh, of the model. And uh, here, uh, theoretically, it's shown that this cannot happen because we keep uh, all the information that we saw from the previous data by recording um, the solution of the latest Riccati ODE. There are many other approaches um, that we can reuse for um, uh, different kinds of machine learning uh, problem. So we could tune the lambda i that are in front of each of the losses. We could also tune the omega k that is in front of the regularization. We can also tune the theta k that are over there. And we can also extend our approach to non-quadratic uh, regularization term, but to more general convex term. For the sake of clarity, uh, I mean, uh, of time, I'm not going to present those, but I got the slide here and you can ask me questions and I'm going to give the summary and conclusion. So, what we've seen here is another uh, connection that arises between certain machine learning problems and multi time hop formula associated to Hamilton Jacobi PDEs and optimal control problems. One of the upshots here is that if you are able to solve one of the problems, meaning the learning problem of the Hamilton Jacobi PDE or the control, then it means that you are able to solve the other ones. So what we did in the first attempt, attempt to leverage this connection is to specialize it for the case of LQR problems for which we have efficient solvers based on the Riccati uh, based methodology. And then we were able to uh, leverage it to uh, provide novel method methodologies and uh, numerical methods for certain machine learning problem where we show that we can use less data and uh, less memory, and um, uh, it gives us a computational advantage compared to traditional method. So there are many different directions that we should follow, and uh, we are currently pursuing a few of those. So one of them is to try to combine the Riccati based approach to other numerical um, approaches that are used for machine learning. Right now, we assume that we, when we are using the Riccati based solution, then you have to stick with the formalism. And so we try to combine 
what we could do with the Ricci solvers and uh, traditional approaches for solving the ma uh, machine learning problem. So we have uh, yet to investigate what's going on when uh, we do not have linear dynamics, but long linear dynamics, and when the um, loss functions uh, are not convex. So we know under non-convexity that we're not going to get an optimal control problem, but we're going to get a differential game. And we are pushing in this direction as of today. And we also need to explore some um, the other way around. By that, it means we could reuse any existing algorithms developed for machine learning problems to actually solve high dimensional Hamilton Jacobi PDs and optimal control problems. So the idea here would be to target those problems and to reuse the tools that have been developed using machine learning problem. Here in this talk, we only consider the case of deterministic uh, and first order Hamilton Jacobi PDE, but we can naturally extend it to the viscous Hamilton Jacobi PDE, which is a second order equation. And to be clear and relating to what was discussed in the previous talk, if you formally differentiate the viscous Hamilton Jacobi PD, then you're going to get a viscous Burgers equation. It turns out that, again, using the call up that we mentioned uh, before, we have a representation formula and we can redo all this machinery uh, for viscous Hamilton Jacobi PD that will connect to Bayesian modeling and uh, uncertainty quantification. More importantly, and this is as of today an open question. It's how all this methodology that we present here in the case of Riccati could actually be um, extended not to the control of ODEs, but as Miroslav said, to the control of PDEs. And uh, there may be uh, a path by considering multi time Hamilton Jacobi PDEs, but this time in infinite dimension. I'll stop here and I'll take your question. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome. Uh, <clears throat> so we have questions from the audience. Uh, hi, I would like to ask a question. Uh, yeah, thank you for the wonderful talk. Yeah. Uh, that, by the way, that's Oded from Tel Aviv University, currently visiting Brown. Uh, my question is a bit more general about the concept of continual learning you mentioned. Not necessarily about this problem, but if I get this right, you basically train the model for one epoch with a batch size of one, right? That would be the equivalent? Yes? Okay. So you mentioned a catastrophic forgetting. And I'm familiar with it more from uh, large language models, where uh, when you do that, often you have a bias for the points that come later in uh, time, in later batches, right? Uh, so I'm curious, how would the order of the data points you have in the data set uh, affect that, and how you manage to combat catastrophic forgetting in general? You mean that um, I didn't get that when the new data comes in? So. So you often like, again, from natural language processing, you have a bit of a recency bias for uh, batches that come later in the training process. So that could cause catastrophic forgetting. So I'm curious if you, if you reshuffle the data or anything, or how, how did you manage to, to combat catastrophic forgetting? I mean, if we reshuffle on the data, I mean, depending on the reshuffling, we can also remove the data and then go back in time, if you if you wish, by changing by removing the data, what we say by the cat catastrophic uh, forgetting in that, since you uh, uh, you have solved the Riccati equation, it is the representation of what the model has to say given all the data that you saw. So you're not going. And this is given by um, um, the theory. So this. Um, solution to the Riccati equations and code on the knowledge that you extracted from the data using this model. That's all I'm saying. Now, if there is a bias uh, in the data that kicks in, then we may be perhaps may be able to change the bias in the regularization. So it means mm, here yeah. we're, and uh, that I don't know how to do it because uh, I mean, 
if you do not give me what the bias is going to be. Otherwise, we may have to, serve, to resolve it for different biases or different guess for the biases. And uh, it means we're going to solve, again, several uh, recatchy ODEs. That may be a viable path, but again, you, it suggests that we need to have some information about how the bias will be and so on. But it's embeddable into this context. Got it, thanks. Sure. Oh, Zogren, you have a, a comment on that? What? Yeah, for the continued learning, uh, actually we avoid catastrophic getting by, by two, step, two, two ways. One is we fix the basis function. So if the model becomes more complicated, then sometimes we don't, you know, fixing a basis function may not be a good choice, but for simpler context, uh, you know, the, the basis function can do a pretty good job in feeding all the data. And another thing is, like Jerome mentioned, uh, the information for the past data uh, is stored in the solution to the to the PD to the OD to the HAPD, and in this context to the uh, Riccati ODEs. So that's you know that also helps avoid the catastrophic forgetting. Yeah, and that, that's my comments. Any more questions for uh, Jerome? You can turn on your camera and. Ask your question. We have time. So Jerome, let me ask a question while they're thinking. Uh, so, so because uh, I want to make sure that everybody understands what this, uh, uh, the, the analogy is here that you're talking about. And uh, some time ago, Matthias Erhard, as um, his student presented this uh, parental front, right? And, um, and, and this was sort of a point of let's say inspiration or also uh, connection to all this. And can you comment on that? And in particular, I want everybody to realize what is the connection between Lambda I and TI? Yep. So let me go to uh, that thing, for instance. So here we, we consider the learning of a first one equation with a, a system F. And F is given uh, like that with the Riclair condition. We are given some um, data sets, Xi, Yi, and Fi. And we're going to use uh, PIN to solve this uh, problem. And the learning problem is given this way. So what we have here is the lambda I, the lambda I that you get here. And so one of the, uh, and the gamma K here. What George uh, is saying is that now, suppose that you solve this problem for a specific set of lambda i and gamma K. So you fix, fix the weights here. And you want to know how the minimizer is going to evolve in terms of the uh, lambda i. So essentially you want to have the map between Every time you give me the lambda i, then I associate the minimizer theta associated to the lambda i. And when the lambda is going to move, then the minimizer are going to move. And what's happening for this problem is that the minimizer are going to follow what we call the Pareto front. The Pareto front corresponds to seeing each of the function independently. We are combining, we want to optimize all of them at the same time. What we do is we do a linear combination, non-negative non combination of all those functions. And for each lambda, we're going to get a minimizer. And now we want to look at the flow of the minimizers and the associated minimal values when those coefficients are going to evolve. And this is what we're gonna get here. You're going to start at uh, some uh, lambda i, and then we're going to solve for a sequence of multi-time. Uh, multi so it means we're going to change the lambda i in time. And for each of them, we can solve for it, and we're going to expose uh, a 1D curve 
of the Pareto front of uh, this multi-objective optimization problem. And so using the RICA TODE, we get a flow of solutions and the flow of solution expose a Pareto front in this higher dimensional uh, uh, curve, not curve, surface that corresponds to all uh, Pareto optimal fronts. So, so uh, Jerome, just to continue on that, because there are some people in the group right now who are trying to develop better lambda i, okay? Yep. Swan and Socrates and so on. So, so th there is at least for in the linear case there is this connection with the multi-time steps, the, the ti's, yep. right? So, yes. So they could they could get some inspiration from here to see if their lambda i's are better or worse from other lambda i's. Because there's a theory yeah, well, connecting yes. lambda i's and ti's here. And they can yes. do computation very quickly using the Riccati equation instead of solving the whole problem, right? Yes, you can do that. And so essentially, this is the set, of, for instance, on the left here, you have a set of possible solutions for your multi-objective function. So for instance, if you have cross-validation, then essentially, you're going to do an intersection between the Pareto front and uh, your cross-validation data, and you want to select that guy. The upshot of doing that is we, we can start here and see if we get the intersection. So we can leverage uh, this to get the intersection, let's say using cross validation, I believe efficiently. But we need some, I would say some extra information. Pareto front is an optimality condition for multi-objective function. And it doesn't give you a uniqueness of a minimizer and gives you a surface. And then we need uh, to select one point of the surface to uh, effectively have um, uh, the solution to the machine learning problem. And typically you can uh, do that using a little bit of uh, cross-validation. And now instead of trying to learn cross-validate and learning again and so on, you can combine the two by using the evolution of the Pareto front easily. <laughs> So I don't, I don't know if people see the connection between lambda i's and ti's, right? The multi-time Hamilton Jacobi and the multiple lambdas. Zogren um, says yes, yes. Zogren, you're you are a co-author in the paper, so I hope you do. Yeah. <laughs> but are others uh, who are who, because there's lots of people, including our group now, trying to find from all these self-adaptive ways the lambda <laughs> i, which set is better, and which yeah. and can we improve it, and so on. There's a there's a, so, so there's theory here that could help. Maybe, maybe uh, they, they can talk to Jerome and give yeah, some yeah. guidance. I mean, One because of typically, what you want to minimize, if you are given, let's say, in the two case, you are given a function f1 of x, you are given a function f2 of x, and uh, and uh, the idea is, I mean, you want to. It's a vector. Now you see it as a vector, and you want to optimize both of them. And one of the things that can be done is if you are given a Pareto, I mean, what is the Pareto front of those guys? <coughs> if they are non-convex in general, the Pareto front will not be convex. It could look like this. But if you consider the lambda one, F1, plus lambda two, F2, so again, at X, well, the sum of the lambda i is one and the lambda i are non-negative. So you do a convex combination of those guys. Then what you're going to do, you're going to generate a convexification of the Pareto front. So maybe your front was like this, and this is the convexification of the Pareto front. So maybe what we could do, this is what we're going to track. We track the convexification of the Pareto front. And then we could be able maybe to detect the true Pareto front uh, optimality by uh, using a little bit of cross correlation and so on. The upshot is it's easy using this met methodology to track, uh, to expose a 1D curve of the Pareto front. This is what it says. 
Does it clarify a bit, George? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I just want to. You already have said it, but I, I just for emphasis, let's say. For, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as I said, to introduce to Socrates and Juan, that's something that they, they have not thought about these connections. Uh, any mm -hmm. other questions for Jerome? I know it's been a long afternoon, but I, it was uh, for me. It was a tremendous uh, uh, three hours, actually. Um, so uh, I'm satisfied for the weekend. <laughs> lots, lots, lots to think about. Any any questions for Jerome? Okay, Jerome, you forgot to give the reference, the paper. Uh, it was uh, at the very beginning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the paper. Oh, hi, Jerome. This is Jen. Yeah. Uh, can I ask one question? Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> so thanks for the very nice talk. And uh, so uh, I'm interested in the continual learning part. And uh, I heard there is an algorithm called recursively square uh, before. So I'm not sure if you have heard of that. So yeah. I think that is also an algorithm uh, for like uh, online learning of uh, least square problems. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it, it, ha it's, it has a, uh, the form is very close to your yeah. Riccardi equation, but it's in the discrete form. So not like continuous. Mm -hmm. Do you have any comment on that? Uh, I don't know the method you are talking about, but we, we have to investigate and see the connection. If, I don't know, I, because I don't know the paper. Zokran, do you know, do you know this uh, method? No. Yeah, uh, I just attach it in the chat. Ah, thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, if, if no more uh, uh, questions, uh, maybe Zogren, you can close the today session. All right. Uh, thank you, Jerome, for the presentation. And thanks everyone for attending this week's Quorum Seminar. And yeah, everyone had a good weekend. See you next week. Bye. Thank you again for inviting me. Have a nice weekend. Thanks. Thank you, thanks. George. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you.